Good morning. Uh, this is Edirecchio, and this is Upper Valley Wood Turning Meeting. Uh, it's, uh, as John put on the board, January 20th, um, Saturday morning. Uh, we have the privilege of having John Siegel demonstrating his fort, and that is um, working with spindles, working with the infamous skew chisel, um, <laughs> and a variety of other evil weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> uh, but John is internationally known. You saw his face back there on Wood Turning Magazine, the British publication nationally. I, w I always like to say, if I give him an introduction, he is a founding member of the Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers. Um, he has been on the steering committee almost continuously since since it started and responsible for, uh, with two other people, the uh, GIS or the Guild in School um, uh, movement that's been fostered by the Guild. So it, it's really quite a, a privilege. John is a very meticulous turner, as I pointed out with his, uh, the ferrule, so called ferrule, on the pool cue. He makes his, he's a metal worker as well as a uh, woodworker. And um, he's going to lead us through using these various tools. And I think you're going to talk about duplication too, John. Is yeah, that part of it? Yeah, part of the talk is how do you, so I have 10 salt shakers. They look basically different. <laughs> 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 anyway, okay, John, you're on. Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, it's been many years since I've addressed this group, maybe four years, I guess. something like three years, anyway. Uh, so I'm John Siegel. I've been turning wood. Well, like so many people, I was introduced to wood turning in seventh grade shop class. But, you know, my father and his brothers had a woodworking business in Chicago. So he, when I said, oh, I did this thing in class today on, the, on a lathe, and he was excited that I was excited. So we went to Sears and I got a, a little lathe. So when I was 14, I had my own small lathe. And so I've been turning wood for 55 years. Um, for, I came to New Hampshire in the 80s and I was running the industrial arts department at Proctor Academy where I taught woodworking and metalworking. I did some wood turning during that time and I, I taught many beginners, high school students during that time. So I learned quite a bit about teaching. And you know, they say, you never learn something so well as when you must teach it. Because you need to solidify what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're going to explain to it. And I, since uh, I'm quoting, I guess I'll quote Albert Einstein who said, you don't really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. Of <laughs> course, <laughs> he was talking about nuclear physics. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I really, I really do enjoy teaching, and I'm really happy to be here. One of the things that Peter tells me often is that almost everyone in this group makes bowls, and there are not very many spindle turns in this group. So one of the things I'm gonna, the, the point of view I'm gonna come at is what, what things do you have to do equipment-wise and mentally to transition from bowl turning, which may be what you're most familiar with, into spindle turn. And I'm so glad that Ed brought up the issue of duplication right away. I often wonder, is the reason that a lot of people don't gravitate towards spindle turn is because they don't want to have to make two things that are exactly alike. <laughs> uh, however, uh, you know, you might be making sets of salad bowls or whatever. So um, it's not necessarily true that you don't have to address duplication just because you're doing bowl turn. Um, yes, yeah, so I back on that table are a bunch of spindle turns that I brought. I, I didn't know where else to put them. I just put them there so you guys could look at them. From time to time, I might have somebody bring one or two of those up if I need one to make a, a, a illustrate a point or something. And also that uh, magazine that Ed referred to. That so that was a year and a half ago. The British magazine Wood Turning did a profile about me. I thought it was a very yeah. Let me put these away. Then. I've never seen anything as straight as that in a pool cue. That's the straightest one I've ever seen. Right <laughs> Yeah. Well, a pool cue, a pool cue is nothing if it isn't straight. You bet. 
Okay. Give me just a moment to put these away safely. Uh, while I take the break a minute, uh, after we're finished, uh, I'd ask some people to stay so we can help put Peter's shop back together. Shouldn't take us too long, Peter, in an, an hour or something like that, maybe. But there's a lot of heavy equipment here. So I mentioned that when I was teaching high school, what? I need to stand. find the camera. Huh? This camera right here. Right here. You want me to stand there? But I need to go over here because this is what I'm talking about. I'm going to be here for a few minutes and then I okay. will go over there. Okay. Well, then I'll let you just attend to right. mine. Um, I mentioned that when I was teaching high school, I had opportunity to teach so many beginners. Almost all of my students were complete beginners. Um, and I know that you're not beginners, but maybe you're beginners at spindle turning. But I think it's a good idea to start at the beginning, to start with the very basic things. And you know, I'm calling my talk basic. So, so if this is stuff you already know, you know, I hope I'll quickly get to some stuff you don't already know. <laughs> um, but this is for everyone, and especially people who have not done spindle turning. I'm going to start really at the beginning, just for a moment, and talk about the action of a chisel. And many of you who have, a lot of people who start with wood turning, maybe they've never held a wood turning chisel, but they've, almost everyone has held a chisel or done a little bit of wood carving, or maybe just mortise to hinge or whatever. But taking an ordinary wood carving gouge like this and applying it to the wood, uh, I'm just gonna lay the chisel on the wood and I'm working back and forth and, and nothing's happening because just the bevel of the chisel is rubbing the wood. But as I raise the hand a little bit, something starts to happen. And I can carve out pieces like that. One thing that's pretty intuitive is that if I raise the handle, it's gonna cut deeper. And if I lower the handle, it's gonna climb out of the cut. So I can make little scooping cuts like that simply by moving my hand in that direction. So what's guiding the chisel is the bevel, that the bevel is resting on the wood, and then it engages, and by lowering the handle, the bevel pushes the edge up out. The point of this is simply this, that the presence of a tool rest does not change this basic principle, that the chisel is guided by the bevel, just like in this situation. It doesn't change just because I have the chisel on a tool rest. Now, for example, you wouldn't try to carve wood by doing this, would you? Now, you can carve wood that way. In fact, here are some little particles of wood that are being removed this way. But the surface finish that I get, doing it that way is really terrible, as opposed to this, which is a cutting action, and this, is a scraping action. So I'm trying to clarify the difference between cutting and scraping. In, in a cutting tool, the bevel is guiding the wood, guiding the edge, and the depth of cut is being controlled by the, in other words, it's sort of like a boat going through the water. It's the blunt end that pushes the pointed end in the right direction. <laughs> Right? So I can hold this chisel back here and, and guide it. I don't need to force it about this way. And scraping is a completely different <laughs> principle where the bevel is not in contact with the wood. Now, we have in wood turning two distinct classes of tools, cutting tools and scrapers. Now, in the cutting tool division, you have basically gouges and skews. Um, the scrapers come in all different shapes, but they all work pretty much the same way. And the difference between a cutting tool and a scraper is the difference between this and this. Now, the point of all this discussion is to say that scrapers are almost never used <laughs> in spindle cut. Now in bowl turning, you need both cutting tools and scrapers. There are definitely times when you need scrapers. One of the things you may notice about my demonstration, you may not have noticed, is I have a square piece of wood here, and I did that for a very sly reason. 
It's not exactly obvious looking at this piece of wood that all this demonstration that I've done, I'm working across the grain. Nonetheless, I'm getting nice curly chips like this, right? In spindle turning, you're cutting across the grain 100% of the time. So what I'm demonstrating here is the action that a chisel takes in, in a spindle turning, where you're cutting across the grain 100% of the time. So scraping, I'm going to pass these around. Scraping is a very effective method of working or finishing wood when you're going with the grain. But it's terrible when it goes across the grain because you inevitably get a very poor finish when you scrape across the grain. With a cutting tool, there's not a lot of difference in the finish that you get going with the grain or across the grain. And these little sample blocks, so you see in each one of these blocks, one piece is this way, the other piece is perpendicular. Pass these around and you'll be able to see that. And this is why you get such a terrible finish when you're scraping on a spindle turn, because you're going 100% of the time, you're going across the grain. Now, you notice when I said not to use scrapers and stuff, I said almost never. I mean, you should never say, never say never. <laughs> there, there are situations in spindle turning where you have to scrape. Extremely delicate little details of very miniature pieces are like rosewood chess sets. I mean, these are examples of where scrapers are really very handy <laughs> and useful and, almost, and actually necessary. But we're talking, I'm talking about spindle turning on a normal scale, and that means furniture parts, essentially, two-inch diameter stuff, which is probably what you're going to be doing mainly in the beginning. So, um, and, I, you know, the work that I do, uh, I do port, I love doing porch posts and, and classic columns. So uh, I, I turn work pieces that weigh hundreds of pounds, architectural pieces. Uh, so I work in that scale. Most of you will never work in that scale because you're, you don't have the equipment to do that. But, you know, basically what I'm going to talk about today is uh, is working, you know, two to three inch diameter work. Yeah. Well, shear scraping still scraping. I don't, I don't use shear scraping myself. Uh, I'm not sure why. That's kind of, that's a very hard question for me. A little bit more. Uh, sure. Yep. Hmm? Great. Set in your ways. I am set in my ways. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if it works, it works. Yes, yeah, so if it works for you and you know how, how to control it, then definitely do it. I mean, I was thinking of watching Peter Block do it last month. Um, I'm, I'm going to connect right here to something Peter Block was talking about last month. Get this out of the way. Um, last month, Peter said that he doesn't use side grind gouges. And this month, I'm going to tell you that I don't use side grind gouges. So now two months in a row, you're having professional wood turners tell you that they don't use side grind gouges ever. Um, what can I say about that? I think, I think side grinding is a fad that has made wood turning harder for beginners to learn. And it certainly has made sharpening much harder. And I don't really see the advantages of it. And so that's all I'm gonna say about it. But again, you know, if you're doing it and it works for you and you're comfortable with side grain gougers, then you should probably keep doing that, at least until you start rethinking it or make a transition. All right, so I'm gonna start. <coughs> Before I turn any wood, I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about Before I turn any wood, I'm going to start talking about chisels. So let's assume you're doing bowl turning now. You've got your bowl gouges and you've got your scraper. So what chisels do you need to transition over to spindle turning? Well, there are five chisels that you have to have. Five, and I'm going to call these must have <coughs> chisels. Uh, 
Okay. All right, number one. Number one is the roughing gouge. And I'm going to put the size here. I'm recommending a three quarter inch uh, roughing gouge if you only have one roughing gouge. And it used to be uh, that roughing gouges came in two sizes, a three quarter and a one and a quarter. Uh, I have a one and a quarter. And I don't think I've used it for 10 or 20 years. It's just too big. I mean, it might be good for turning pine porch posts, but for furniture work, especially in hardwood, especially in figured wood, it's just too big. Especially in long and thin work where workpiece vibration is a problem. It's just too big. Uh, now you can get roughing gouges in a variety of sizes. Um, and this is a three quarter, it's three quarter inch is the distance inside the flute. The overall size is about an inch. It's about three quarter inside the flute. So that looks like this. And one thing you'll notice about a rough and gouge, if it's sharpened correctly, is that when you look at it face on, what you're just seeing is a rectangle. The end is perfectly square. It has no nose. And that the corners are sharp right angles. So these are the characteristics of a correctly sharpened roughing gouge. Sharp corners and square across, no bulging of the edge. Or I call that a nose. There's no no. Um, so that's my roughing gouge that I use. I use these to make the, those full cues. Yes? How do you avoid having the nose? What am I doing wrong? Well, uh, a roughing gouge is the same thickness all the way across. Because it's made from a flat piece of metal that's rolled up, right? It's almost like a section of pipe. Okay? So because the wall thickness is the same everywhere, it should pretty much stay as you grind it. If you grind evenly all the way from side to side, then it, it should keep that shape pretty well. Um, you know, if anything, it should be even a little this way, but it should not, the edge should not bulge out when you, when you grind it. And if you're getting the corners rounded, it's because you're rolling it over too far. So you need to just stop as the, as the of course, I do all my uh, sharpening on a belt. I guess a lot of you do too, under the influence of Peter. <laughs> uh, and, and so as you get this on the belt, as you come around and you see the belt coming to the corner, you just ease off, make sure you just don't roll over too far. Right? Why Oh, that's so that you can, um, all right, let's see what we have here. All right, so this would be like a, a piece of furniture. Um, so after you make the V cut, which is the first thing you do, then you bring the roughing gouge around, and, you, and as you get into the side, you roll it over like this, and you can run the roughing gouge right up into the corner. You don't need a separate operation like the ski chisel to do that. Because you're just roughing out and you just keep rolling it over. So, right when you get into the side, boom, that corner is in there and that's done. So, you got the roughing out right into the corner in one step. I hope I'll get a chance to actually show you how. Okay. John, do you want to show one that isn't sharpened correctly? Oh, well, you know, yours is only rounded a tiny bit. Okay. <laughs> and we're looking at this before. Okay. before the meeting. <laughs> that's all right. Okay, uh, spindle gouge. All right, half inch, and then a spindle gouge, three eighths. <clears throat> Now, what's the difference between a spindle gouge and a bowl gouge? Well, the difference is just the shape of the flute. So on a, on a bowl gouge, the flute is more or less parabolic shape, something like that. So uh, this would be bowl. And on a spindle gouge, the edge is just a circular shape like that. It could be a little more narrow or it could be a little bit wider, but it's just circular. You know, it's, it's so, oh, it's been over here. Okay, 
So this is the difference between a spindle gouge and a bowl gouge. It's just the shaping of the fluid. Um, and these are the th these normally come in four sizes: um, a quarter, three eighths, half, and three quarter. But for most of the work, um, I think these two sizes are probably all you'll need. Now the half inch spindle gouge looks like this. Um, I have, during the demo, I'll probably use this one. These are both identical. This is the ASP steel, and this is the normal high speed steel. Um, and here's the 3 8 version. So these are the two sizes of spindle gouge. Since I have the extra, I'm going to pass this around. So you can just look at how it's sharpened, how much nose radius it has. Um, and I sharpen all my spindle gouges with about that much nose radius. Um, so in other words, when you buy a chisel, I always tell people when you buy a chisel, you should hold it like this and look at it and, and completely cover up the edge. Because the edge as supplied in the store, or maybe a, a yard sale, who knows, um, was probably ground by a person who never turned any wood in their life. <laughs> and uh, you should never assume that the way the gouge, when you purchased it, is the correct way to sharpen it. You should never assume that. Now, in the case of sorby chisels, I think the way they sharpen them is very, very close to the way I sharpen them. Hardly have to change them at all. Um, but this is not always true. And especially if you're buying a used chisel at a flea market, uh, probably has not been sharpened correctly. Um, so this, so when you buy a chisel, now you could take the scissors, you could grind it straight across like a rough and gouge. Um, or you can put more or less of a curvature on it. So the nose radius that I use is kind of that much nose radius, right? Kind of that much. And that's, uh, that's the way I, I do uh, all, of my, all of my spindle gouges kind of to that nose radius. All right. So the, oh, I should show you this too. If you, how many of you have ever, ever gone to the tool sale in Nashua? Yeah, uh, I love going to that, that. And this is a uh, a Buck Brothers blade. It's probably over a hundred years old. Uh, I put a handle. Uh, these blades without a handle, you can usually get for about ten dollars. And you know, you're a wood turner, you can make a handle, right? Um, this is this is a, of course they're carbon tool steel, but they're really wonderful chisels. I'll just pass that around. So that's, a, that's also a 3 8 um, spindle gouge. Uh, you might say, oh, I don't want to buy those old chisels. That's that old fashioned crappy steel. You know, it was good enough for 3,000 years. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, high speed steel. But what is high speed steel? Does anyone know what high speed steel is? All right, it's just tool steel with tungsten added to it. And it was invented around the turn of the century. It gained popularity. Uh, the teens into the 1920s, and by 1930, a lot of people were paying more attention to high speed steel in machine shops. Then World War II came, and the need for speed <laughs> was there. And by the end of World War II, just in that five year period, um, carbon tool steel, the old kind of steel, completely disappeared from machine shops. <laughs> uh, and high speed steel started to be used for machine knives in woodworking, such as planer and joiner knives. But high-speed steel wasn't used for turning chisels until the 1980s. Now, why there was this 50-year delay, I don't know. But starting in the 80s, we started seeing high-speed steel turning chisels. Of course, by that time, I already had 50 chisels. <laughs> but, but what happened then, I said, well, certain chisels that I've had for decades and they're wearing out, I'm going to replace them with high speed steel. So from that, from the 80s until today, I use high speed steel chisels right alongside my old carbon tool steel chisels. And I'll tell you, there isn't that much difference. Yes, there's a difference, but it's not five times the difference that they claim it is. It might be twice. No, what I'm talking about better. Well, it means that you don't have to sharpen it as often. All right. Is there an easy way to tell the difference? Like if you were at that flea market or <clears throat> looking at the 
Well, I can tell by the, the way it's manufactured. So high-speed high steel gouges are usually milled from round stock, and the old carbon tool steel tools <laughs> were forged. Um, also, you know, all, all the modern, all the high-speed steel chips are not that old. The markings are still probably on them, and it says HSS on them. But I'm gonna, you know, that, I'm glad you raised that question because I'm gonna point something out. All right. So this is a, well, this was the first high-speed steel chisel I ever bought. So I've had this for 30 years. <coughs> it's about an inch shorter than it was when I bought it. Now, how is it possible that I've had this for 40 years and it's only an inch shorter than when I bought it? And the answer, I'm sure Peter will tell you, is having a good jig. If you have a good jig, you're going to take less than a thousandth of an inch off each time you sharpen it. That means you're getting at least a thousand, maybe two thousand sharpenings per inch of blade consumed. And that once you have a good jig, you're never going to have to buy any chisel because you'll never grind them down. All right, so this is a modern high speed steel ski chisel. And what you'll notice is that the shaft, the shaft is rectangular um, and it's the same thickness throughout. And it's very good steel. But is it really a well designed tool? <laughs> not as well designed as this hundred year old. What makes this better? Notice it gets thicker as it goes up toward the handle. And notice that the cutting away here to make the tang is almost negligible. But what's important? Why is that good? Because that gives this blade a lot of strength right in the middle where you need it. And in a modern, some of these. Look at how the, the, tang, the uh, tang is cut down so much that it creates a very weak point right there where you need the most strength, they've created the most weakness. So yeah, great steel, has all the tungsten in it, 18%, wonder, blah, 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 but not as well designed as this 100-year-old. So if you do buy antique tools, this is, the, this is the handle that came with it when I bought it. I don't know if it's a good tool. Certainly the ferrule is not original because it's copper. Anyway, uh, you know, if you go to this, the antique tool sales, I just love finding diamonds in the rough like that. And I buy blades, you know, with no handle. Usually, you know, in a hundred year old chisel, the handle is still there is cracked and beat up anyway. Um, so that brings me to the, uh, to number four. Now I've used up some of my board here, but I'll try to squeeze in here. Number four, is a skew chisel. And the size skew chisel that I was just showing you is three quarters um, or five eighths or five eighths and that's the width of the, of the blade. Now there are many people who use these really big skew chisels or these are the one inch ones or even the one and a quarter really big skew chisels. I don't, I, don't, I have those chisels I haven't used them for decades. I don't like the, the these big, heavy, clunky skew chisels. For one thing, there's an acre of surface to grind every time you sharpen it. And, you, and you're only using one eighth of an inch of it, and you're just using that little point anyway. There's really no yeah, advantage to having a gigantic skew chisel. These made and a huge disadvantage because it's it so table. difficult and time consuming to, to grind them. Um, I can't even wrap my fingers around it conveniently, you know, to feel comfortable. But, oh, yeah, I see that. Um, it's not, so yeah. this, um, Hurry up. I, yeah. some of you have been to my shop, you know, I have, I have one really large lathe that I do porch posts and columns. <laughs> I've turned work pieces that weigh 500 pounds on, on that lathe. The lathe weighs 5,000 pounds. So putting a 500 pound work piece on it, it's only 10% of the weight of the machine, and the machine handled it like nothing. But people say, well, John, you do all that really huge turning. You must have some really big chisels. Well, it's really quite the opposite. You know, the bigger the work, the smaller the chisel that you want. Well, why is that? Because when you've got hundreds of pound piece of wood turning, you want to be in control all the time. <laughs> and you don't want to uh, introduce a chisel that's going to create too broad of a chip or engage too much edge at one time that you might not be in control of. 
So yes, I turned 500 pound work pieces, but I own, this is the biggest chisel. This is the biggest skew chisel that I use. I have bigger ones, but I don't use them because this I'm in control of all the time. Uh, point being that it's, it's not correct that the size of the chisel should be commensurate with the size of the work. <laughs> the size of the chisel, chisel should be commensurate with the width of the chip that you're creating. <laughs> So the width of the chip is the limiting factor in all wood uh, in terms of the amount of force created at the edge of the tool. So in very soft wood, you can use a larger chisel. In very hard wood, you just need a smaller chisel no matter what the size of the work. The size of the work being more or less irrelevant in that decision. Oh, a little bit about skew chisels. <laughs> um, you notice that the, the angle of my edge is a little bit more than you would normally see. That's just my own preference. Most people use about a 30 degree and I'm using about like a 40 degree. Um, that's just my preference. And some people put a curve on that edge. Uh, Richard Raffin popular, popularized that type of grind. Um, I don't put a curve on mine, except maybe just a little bit. Um, I, I think that putting a curve on the edge of the, you know what I'm talking about? It would, it would make the chisel look like this, kind of, like that, you know, as opposed to what I um, By putting a curve on it, I think they're trying to make the skew chisel behave more like a gouge by giving it a nose, right? Um, and I think if you want a chisel with a nose, you would use a gouge. That's what it's, <laughs> that's what it's meant for. It's designed for that. Um, I think the problem with this is that the, so the, this is called the uh, the toe, and this is called the heel. Yeah, I get, let me just back up a little bit. You know, in the last century, the English turners, or last centuries, the English turners, um, who popular, popularized the use of what they called the chisel. It's simply a chisel that's ground on both sides, used for wood turning. And, and they, they used to grind them straight across. They didn't have the angle. So that each corner was the same, 90 degrees. Um, and then when the Americans started putting an angle on it, they had to come up with a new name. Instead of just calling it the chisel, they called it the skew chisel because skew means angular. And so that's why we have this name of skew chisel. Um, but What's beautiful about a skew chisel is that it gives you a choice of a acute point, which is toe, and a obtuse angle here, which is the heel. And when you put the rounded edge on it, what you're really losing is the acuteness of that toe. And the acuteness of the toe, to me, is a really important feature of the skew chisel, uh, which you pretty much lose when you put that curvature on it. Um, there are skew chisels made from round stock as opposed to rectangular stock. And I highly recommend those, uh, especially in the smaller sizes. I think when you get above three eighths of an inch, the round ones become kind of clunky. Um, but in the small sizes for detail work, uh, the, round, the round shank, uh, here, let me show you one of those. So, well, this is a 5 16 diameter round, ground like a straight across skew chisel. I'm going to show you how this works. This is something, so this is a chisel I made myself, cost about 75 cents to make that. While we're on the subject of, um, while we're on the subject of gouges, oh, so here, here's a round, is the camera seeing this all right? Yeah. yeah. Here's, here's a round shank skew chisel. Uh, and for small detail work, uh, the round is just perfect. It's, it's, it's easier to hold on to, it's easier to rotate it, okay? Much better. Um, we were talking about, uh, about gouges. And I was saying how the spindle gouges are made in uh, four sizes, quarter, three-eighths, half, and three-quarter. But what if you want some in-between size like five-sixteenths? So, uh, I really felt the need for a 5 16 gouge. So this is a gouge that I made myself. Again, this is about 75 cents worth of steel. Um, and the heat treatment, well, that's a, another subject for another day. It's, if you just have a propane torch, you can do your own heat treatment. 
not uh, not right. They figured it out 3,000 years ago in Anatolia, which is now Turkey. Um, it's not rocket science. All right, and last and definitely least, can you heat high speed steel like that? High speed steel you cannot heat treat at home, but carbon tool steel you can heat treat at home. Yes. Can you describe how the the skew cuts? Uh, I always get a catch using the yeah. skew. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get to that in a minute when okay. I get the wood on the lathe. All right. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So um, number five is a chisel that I refer to as a necessary evil, <laughs> and that's the parting tool. And the type that I prefer is called the diamond. The diamond pattern. Um, so the diamond pattern looks like this. That's, cross -section. that's the cross section. So this is often referred to as the American pattern. Um, and why do I why do I call this chisel? Uh, you see, there's a cross section. Mm -hmm. Why do I call this a necessary evil? Simply because it's overused in spindle turning. Um, it is a, a really convenient thing to to uh, locate a point at a certain diameter or a certain position, uh, which is part of the roughing out process. Uh, but I think where people go wrong with it. Uh, Let's see, I don't know if I, all my turnings are down there. But if you have a long turning, a, a long curve base shaped form, well, uh, give me like that skinny oak one. That's the one, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this would be a good, just to illustrate a point. I think where a lot of people go wrong is they would, they would measure it here and here and here and here. And then they would make a parting tool cut here and here and here and here and say, okay, now I got all these cuts. All I have to do is connect the dots. That's exactly the wrong way to go about this. Because connecting the dots is, is difficult. As, the, as your gouge encounters every one of those parting tool cuts, it kind of crashes and falls into that hole. And then you've got a ding there that you have to kind of smooth out. It's better to try to maintain the curvature that you want throughout the roughing process. Simply, like if this is the small end, I would start roughing here and I'd go down, down, down. And then when I get to the final cut, I've already got the curvature of the basic shape that I want, and I'm simply smoothing it out. That is a much better way to create these long straight, long curvature or even straight uh, uh, features in the turn. Uh, so there you go. Those, so if, if you've been doing bowl turning and you say, well, what do I need to buy to get into spindle turning? Those are the five tools. Now, if you wanted to expand beyond that, um, I would say here are the things, besides, besides the round skew chisel. Um, here's a type of a, a shallow gouge. Now, if you go to yard sales and you find uh, turning chisels from the middle of the 20th century, they almost always look like this. They're made by Greenlee and, uh, you know, Distant and who knows who all the other companies. Uh, and they're very shallow and wide. And they have certain usefulness in, um, on softwood. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how you would use this kind of chisel instead of a ski chisel to make long tapered shapes like on that leg and why it's better than a skew chisel. Now, if you, these are kind of thing you can find at a yard sale for a dollar. Um, this one's high speed steel, but this one is not. This was made by Swan, a very well-known chisel manufacturer, almost as well-known as Buck Brothers back 100 years ago. So here's a shallow spindle gouge and I've ground straight across. It's almost like a small roughing gouge. Um, this is what I use to turn tenons on the end of a baluster or a chair part that has to fit. Uh, this is a perfect chisel for doing little straight sections. Um, control, you know, where finish is not important. Uh, 
And back to this question of um, spindle gouges. Often when you buy the quarter inch spindle gouges at the store, the flutes are ground all the way up. And they do that because they want you to get the most life out of the chisel. So that you can grind, 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 get a lot of life out of it. But the problem with that is by, by taking out two thirds of the material all the way up to here, they are so weak in the middle. I've never seen these quarter inch gouges, you can literally bend them in your finger. And they're totally useless if you're extended more than an eighth of an inch off the tool rest. So here's a, a, a quarter inch spindle gouge that I made myself out of round stock. And because the flute only occupies the first inch, uh, it's very rigid in the middle. And uh, it performs much better than the skull. Uh, so the, these chisels that I make are only heat treated in the first inch. So it's essentially what you have is a, is a hard tip tool. And so the shank is, is still very hard, a very um, tough and resilient. So it's not going to break because only the tip is hardened. Question. Yeah. Does that improve malleability because it's not so hard? Because it's not hard. Give you a better feel? Do you think? Than no, no. It just it means it's not going to snap. <laughs> or, or if you drop it. Uh, any questions about chisels before we start cutting wood? Yes. Angle. Oh, okay. sure. Well, um. I don't grind my chisels quite as acute as some turners. Um, my Darlow advocates 25 degrees. Uh, I don't. I don't grind my chisel. I grind mine more like 35. I think the chisels are much easier to control when they're not as acute. Uh, like a skew chisel should be 20 degrees on each side. That makes 40. Um, and maybe 18 degrees on each side. So I would say. What, what I do is between 35 and 40, but if you took a, 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 a consensus of all the different authors, I think the average that you'd find would be about 30 to 35. Right, so I'm, my chisels are about five degrees less cute than I think what the average. Nobody agrees on this. <laughs> and, and also different chisels may be uh, a, a little different. Um, I've read where some, several places that roughing gouges should be ground at a very blunt angle, like 45. And um, I used to do that. I'm not sure why. And once I started grinding my roughing gouges more acute, you know, back, back down to about 35, I'm much happier with them. They uh, definitely work better. Yeah, maybe changing better. Oh, yeah. You know, this is a question that keeps coming up. What is a detail gouge? A detail gouge is any gouge that you use to make details. <laughs> there is no exact type of tool that is a detail gouge. And, and because everyone sort of varies on, on that. I mean, a catalog, you'll see something labeled detail gouge. Well, just an ordinary gouge that someone's put a lot of side grind or more acute angle or something on. It's just the opinion of that person who ground it. Um, well, they say they have more steel. Oh, oh, the, sh sh the flutes are shallower, so that, yeah. oh, that, of course, that contradicts logic because if it's a detail gouge, it could be, it should be thinner, not thicker, right? Because if it's only being used to make details and it's not being used for heavy duty roughing, therefore it should be thinner, not thicker. So that kind of contradicts logic, which it just points, makes my point. And so that's why I always go back to my answer, which is a detail gouge is any gouge you use to make details. <laughs> it's important that the gouge that you're using is the right size for the details that you're making. All right. Now, if you're taking up spindle turning, and I'll assume maybe you haven't done any spindle turning. Um, I mean, I know no one in this room is a total beginner wood turner, but maybe you're begin a beginner at spindle turning. So, <coughs> Um, some of the skills that you need to acquire require practice. And the way that you practice is to use a piece of wood that you have nothing invested in. In other words, for God's sakes, don't try to make any. <laughs> Just make chips. Because in the practicing and the making of chips is how you, you get that hand-eye coordination, muscle memory, and, and 
by using a piece of wood that you have nothing invested in, you're not afraid to make a mistake. Uh, like the worst thing you can do is to uh, glue up some segmented thing or layered thing out of 100 pieces of wood and then put it on the lathe and you're so terrified and afraid to make a mistake because you've already invested 50 hours in gluing this thing up. You're never going to learn wood turn. You're just going to pick up a scraper and just scrape little bits at a time because that's safe, maybe. Um, and that's not the way you're going to learn wood turn. The way to learn wood turning is to go out to the firewood pile. And that's where you'll find your material for your practice session. And so that's what I did yesterday. And I, I actually went out to my backyard and I cut down a tree. And this, yeah, there's the one I made yesterday. It's yeah. thought out since yesterday. It, yeah, it was frozen. <laughs> well, either. Pass that around. I made that yesterday. Just to, I cut down. So uh, a piece of wood like this, of course, you have nothing invested in except a few minutes it took to cut it. Uh, you might find something like this out in the firewood pile just the way it is. But what I would do is cut the ends square and cut off any splits on the end. You don't want your centers going into cracks because that can throw things off. Let's see. Uh, just to intervene, John, yeah. you, you talk about spindles, but anybody turning long grain, salt and pepper shaker, pepper yeah. mill, sure. vases, I mean, yeah. all your techniques are applicable to that. Yes. So what is a spindle turning? Right. A spindle turning is any turning where the grain of the wood is parallel to the axis. Right. Peter Block's lamps are spindle turning because the grain of the wood. So that kind of comes back to this, doesn't it? Where I said, in spindle turning, you're cutting across the grain 100% of the time. That's because the grain is parallel to the axis. The tree is a little like The tree is like this. So as it turns, the orientation of the grain does not change, as unlike a bowl turning, where the orientation of the grain is constantly changing, twice per revolution, in fact. And because the orientation of the grain is never changing, that makes certain things much easier. For example, the way that you, the way that you approach or attack the wood with the chisel is very straightforward. You always go downhill. Now, what does downhill mean? Well, if I had, um, I don't have a pocket. Who has a pocket knife? Yeah. And I, okay. Give me your, give me your pen. I'm going to pretend that it's a pencil, but I won't cut it. So let's pretend. So you're going to sharpen a pencil with a knife. You go this way. What would happen if you tried to sharpen your pencil going this way? You know how whittlers often work this way toward their thumbs. But what would happen if you tried to sharpen a pencil going this way? It would just split and the whole thing would go to heck, right? That's all you really needed. So in, in spindle turning, in spindle turning, the same rules apply. You always go downhill. And that means you're going from the larger diameter down toward the smaller diameter all the time. It's very simple. You just follow that rule and you know you're always going the right direction. Um, now with a, with a piece of wood from the firewood pile, you say, well, how do I get that on center? Well, you know, there is no actual center because it isn't really round. You know, in order for something to have a center, it has to be round. You know, normally you, you don't want to put the center right into the pit because that's usually not exactly in the center. It might be, but it might not. I think in this case it kind of is. Obviously, this maple is notorious for being oval. Uh, and this is maple. And by the way, if you're going out to the firewood pile, look for the maple. Maple is the best. <laughs> it's the most fun and, and turns the most smooth. Now, woods like oak and ash are rather splittery. Those are the ring chorus woods. Um, so the woods that turn really nicely is not oak and ash. It's maple and birch and cherry. And those are the, those are the um, Diffuse porous, diffuse porous woods, uh, and they're the, they're really the best for turning. So you see, this tree was bent over like that, and so each one of these pieces is slightly curved. So I'm going to compensate a little bit for that. Let me move my side over here. Yeah, that's okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to whoop. Going to set the center there. I'm going to take it out turn it around and do that again. And the reason is that I want, I want both ends for this. 
the, the center to be. So as I tighten this, you'll see that center embedding in there. Okay. But that doesn't happen at this end because the center point at this end is on a spring. So it shouldn't be retract. Well, good. Here we are. And always spin the wood before you turn it on. Get the tool rest here. Get the tool rest, you know, close. And spin it before you turn on the motor. And make sure you do that in your bolt turning also. And yeah. Oh, do I, Peter, have to pull this out? You got lights on. Like VFH. Oh, it's on? No. Um, push the green button. Push the green button. Yeah, all right. There we go. <coughs> Just when I was playing with it, I found out that 1,000 RPM seems to work really nicely on this lathe. Um, so before you turn, you know, this, this needs to be reasonably tight, not as tight as you can make it. Tight enough that the spur center doesn't slip. That doesn't slip. Okay. If the spur center is not slipping, then it's tight enough. Make sure the tool rest is tight. So the tool that you start with is uh, obviously the roughing gouge. So here we go. Um, sometimes I feel silly saying this because it's kind of obvious, but make sure that the tool is on the tool nest before it touches the wood. Uh, it's funny how sometimes beginners will take the tool and they'll sort of bring it up like this. And then when the wood hits the chisel, it slams it down on the tool nest. And you can get hurt that way. So the first sound that you hear is that sound. As you bring the chisel up to the work, you have to remember what I was doing here. And the first part of the chisel that touches the wood is not the edge. The first part of the tool that touches the wood is back here, the heel. So as I bring it up, Right now, the heel is hitting. Well, obviously, it's not cutting, just like when I was doing this, and it's not cutting. So I bring this up here, and I raise the handle slowly until I start to see chips coming at the end. <coughs> so again, starting with the handle here, touching the wood, and bringing it up until I see chips occurring at the edge. Now I know I'm at the right angle. And I just lock into that angle. Well, essentially, I've got my hand on my ribs. And uh, that's kind of the way I lock in the, an in the angle. Um, and I'm sure you know that, you so much. that there are times when you need to move the chisel around like this. But there are other times when you need to steady the handle against your body. It's very useful. Uh, so I'm going <laughs> to do that both times. But right now, I've got the chisel steady against my, my body. And that kind of locks in that angle. So here we go, I'm gonna rough this out. And I'm using my hand to deflect the chips away from my face, so they're not flying up in my face. I mean, I could do it like this. John, a question on your tool rest height. You know what, you talk while you're turning, you end up with chips. <laughs> 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 It's a little bit above center. Okay. And the larger the diameter, uh, you have it more above center. But you know, on most lathes, it's not possible to raise the tool rest more than, say, a half inch or maybe at the most three quarters of an inch above center. So that's really your limit. If you're turning something this big, which I frequently do, the moving up and down the tool rest is irrelevant because it doesn't accomplish anything in terms of angle. Mm. I would say, and I, I'm quoting Frank Payne here. I would say most turners, spindle turners, don't work enough on top of the work. It's easier to see what you're doing. It uh, allows you to present the chisel more at a horizontal angle instead of this. Uh, let me rough out a little bit more and then I'm going to stop. Okay. So on the tool rest, um, very important. Whack on the tool rest. And you do this about every five minutes. Oh, you can use this on here. And you can use this on your joiner. <laughs> you can use this on your hand saws. Everything in your shop that moves, you can use this. This is better than paste wax. Why is it? 
Why is this better than paste wax? I'll tell you why. So you've got your can of paste wax, say it's on your table. So, oh, I want to put some wax on. Oh, I got to open the can. Where's that screwdriver? Oh, you walk across the shop and come back to the screwdriver. You open the can. Then you go in and you find that little rag and you put the paste wax. Okay. Then you cut the wood and then also, oh, God. Got to put the lid back on, now it's all full of sawdust. <laughs> all right, this eliminates all those problems and it does the same job and it costs almost nothing. You know, when you buy this, it's, it's in the grocery store where they have the canning sale. You get five blocks in a little box. Um, that's just paraffin wax? It's paraffin, right. Oh, you can use a candle, but not beeswax. Beeswax is kind of sticky and uh, not really quite as lubricated as paraffin. All right, there's my spiel about paste. Let me finish roughing this. Normally I'd put my hand here and deflect the chip. All right. And now I'm gonna stop for a second and talk about So, this is a roughing chip. Sometimes you can learn a lot from chips. You know, I, I think as a machinist, this is one thing I learned. Sometimes studying chips can tell you a lot about the, about the cutting action of the tool. Um, Thanks for your help. <laughs> so if you take one of these chips and break it and look at the end of it, you'll see that it's shaped like this. So that's, that's the shape of a, of a roughing chip. <clears throat> this is the most efficient way to rough. So let me just say, all right, now let's say I'm turning this piece. And you might, you might say, well, why don't I just go down to a certain depth and then feed across very slowly? Instead of what I'm doing here, which is going to a very shallow depth and feeding across very quickly. So the, the distance between these bumps is about three eighths of an inch. That distance is how far the tool travels per revolution of the workpiece. That's called the feed of the tool. Um, so that represents you know, roughly this distance. Right? Now, if you did this alternative method where you would just take the chisel down to a deep and then travel across slowly. Instead of this kind of a, sh of a chip, you'd have a chip that looked like this. Right? Now, both of these chips have approximately the same surface area. So what's the difference? The difference is that this chip is almost 100% end grain. And this chip has the most surface area with the least amount of end grain. That makes this much more efficient than this because it takes three times as much force to cut through end grain as it does to cut across side grain. So the most efficient roughing occurs with a shallow cut and a rapid feed, not a deep cut and a slow feed. That's why you see me whipping back and forth across it because that's how you get the most work done in the least time. And remember, you're roughing, right? So the smoothness of this doesn't matter at this stage. It will very soon, but it doesn't yet. Yeah. Your technique then would maintain the sharpness better because yes. you're not doing as much anger. Yes. Here's something that's counterintuitive, but nonetheless true. I don't know if you all know this. Maybe you do sort of know it intuitively. That a very light cut, a very thin cut, is more wearing on the edge than a very heavy cut. Why is that seems, how could that be? You'd think that the more, the thicker the chip you take, the more force is involved, doesn't that dull the edge more? No, actually it dulls the edge more. Because what happens is that, let's see if I can show you this. <clears throat> so if, if the edge is going into the wood, and here's the parent material, in a, in a very thick cut, the, uh, so this is this is the chip coming off. The the separation actually uh, I didn't draw that right because the edge would kind of be like this. What happens is the edge 
breaks away the wood ahead of itself um, so that the wood never actually touches the edge. It's actually touching the tool behind the edge. Hmm. Now on a very light finishing cut, this is why your chisels dull so quickly when you're in the finishing stage, because you're taking very thin cuts and the edge actually engages in the wood and that's what causes it to wear out. So you made a very good point about the chisel stays sharp longer and also, I'm talking about the efficiency of the uh, of the cut regarding the uh, end grain. Yeah. Right. So we get to this stage, and then, um, well, actually, let me just. Okay. So the, the lathe's running. Um, so the spur center has a spring in it. So when I when I relax the tailstock, you know, this is being driven. When I relax the tailstock, I can stop the wood because the spurs are not engaged. This is a very handy kind of spur center to have, especially in the sanding stage, where you want to stop the work frequently to inspect. You don't want to keep turning the mower on and off. It's very hard on the mower. What do you do? I have some right here for sanding. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't say that until I was asked. <laughs> so I can see there's still a little bit of bark here. Uh, so let me just take off a little bit more and, and see if I can get the whole thing down to where I so I'll take a kind of a intermediate kind of roughly. So that's neither fast or slow. And now to finish off, a very slow feed will give me a good finish. And there we are. So I don't have to turn off the motor to inspect that. All right, here's a tiny bit of bark there. I think I can move it. So now the, now the log, which this was a tree growing in my yard two days ago, and now it's here. It's still frozen. <laughs> I kept them outside overnight so they wouldn't get cracks in the end. So, and so now I'm going to talk about um, some of the basic exercises that you're going to, you're going to want to do and um, a, a better way to practice. So, so some books would say, some of us would say, all right, we're going to practice making beads. So let's just do this. We'll make beads, right? And, uh, and that's a good way to practice beads. So that's really a lousy way to practice beads. Well, first of all, it's very rare that two beads come together into a bead. Uh, in design, that's normally not what happens. Normally what happens is that a bead reaches a cincture to a cone, right? This is, this is the way beads, and, and then you might have another, and I'll, I'll show you. How to make this. This is a much more common kind of design than this. We don't, you very rarely encounter this kind of a design. But the problem with this is that now you've made one, two, three, four, five beads and you've used up that whole piece of wood. Right. And that, that's not a very good way to practice because you just need too much wood. I'm going to show you how to get hundreds of practice strokes out of a single piece of wood like this by employing the simple idea. And the simple idea is that. Once you create a shape, you keep going with that shape over and over and over and over again, um, and, and working from both sides. So the first X, the most important, the first exercise that you want to practice after you've done the roughing out. I, don't, I guess I don't, I don't count the roughing out as one of the exercises. It's just uh, something you learn to do more efficient, efficiently as you do it. Um, so the first exercise is called the ball shape or the bead. So I'm gonna start right at the corner. And um, the bead is a good starting exercise. You're starting with the bevel on the wood. You can always start with the bevel on the wood. And I'm going to start by taking off the corner like this. And every time I go, I just take a little bit more off the corner. I'm using my half inch spindle gouge. This isn't the one I want to go on. Okay. Starting with the bevel on the wood, coming across the top, and going in. So trying to create. Um, just the half of a ball. Move this over. Get a little closer. Now that I've roughed it out, usually after the roughing out, whether it's a square or a log, after the roughing out, you probably want to move your tool rest closer. Some books say that the tool rest should be as close as possible. I don't really agree with that. I think that was written probably by a bowl turner. <laughs> <laughs> because bowl turners always obsess about getting the tool rest. Close because in bowl turning, that's frequently a problem 
getting the tool rest close enough. That's rarely a problem in spindle turns. You know, there are two schools of thought about this. Um, you know, for one thing, like, all right, if I'm using a, a skew chisel, if I'm going in with a, a skew chisel, obviously a, a skew chisel at an angle, I want to make sure that the entire straight part of the chisel is on the tool rest and not the bevel because you don't want this sharp edge on the tool rest and you don't want to be passing over that bump. So you don't want the tool rest too close. The other school of thought is that, remember one of the most common, one of the most common wood turning accidents is getting a finger caught between the work and the tool rest. It's rarely a big deal. I mean, usually you can pull it out and you've got a, like a burn where the wood is scrapes and smears. I suppose in some cases you could break your finger or something. Um, I've gotten my finger in 55 years. Yes, it's happened to me, but I haven't never broken a bone. Um, so one argument is if you keep the tool rest like five eighths of an inch away, then that can't happen because it's, you know, your fingers are smaller than that space. So that can't get in. <coughs> the other school of thought is move it really close so that it can't, but you know, even being, where it is now, a quarter of an inch away, it could still pull on this right at the end where your finger is only that big. So just remember that that's a very common wood turning accident. And um, I, I usually keep my tool rest, you know, about three eighths of an inch away and um, try to keep my fingers out of it. So here we are. How do you do this? Well, you start with the chisel straight up. Uh, is the camera seeing the chisel? Yep. It starts with a chisel. Maybe rotate it about five degrees in the direction you're going to travel. And I've got the handle about five degrees back. This is perpendicular. I'm pulling it five or ten degrees back. And I'm looking for that corner right there where I'm going to start. And as this proceeds down the hill, uh, I get about halfway down. I start to swing the handle to the right. And I'm rotating the chisel to the three o'clock position. So I'm starting at 12 o'clock and ending at three o'clock. So the chisel is gonna rotate 90 degrees from this position to this position. And I'm swinging the handle to the right. Now it's, the swinging of the handle doesn't begin until you're about halfway down the hill. Um, about there. Okay, now when you do these practice things, you're gonna end up with a core which is about half the diameter of what you started with. And resist the temptation to go deeper and deeper each time. So here's how you would practice this. You just go in, and you just go in, and you just go in, and you just go in. So you see why this is a much better way to practice? Because if I'm taking about a 30 second of an inch um, on each cut, that means I'm getting 30 practice strokes per inch of wood, right? Uh, and that's why this is a very, and remember, this is your most important product because in this is the learning process. Maybe this is what your brain looks like. <laughs> so it's, usually, usually it's, it's also, you know, muscle memory. What they call muscle memory. So you did it from there, it took a lot less than 30 seconds. But the important thing is to try to maintain approximately the same thickness of shaving all the way down and ending with the chisel up. The, and you see, what I've got here is core. Do I care about the roughness of that? No, I don't care about that at all. Um, but the final diameter of that core should be about half of the diameter of what you started with. You don't want to go too deep, you'll end up with a piece that's so thin that the flexibility of the workpiece becomes a problem and it'll vibrate. And you have enough problems that, you know, you don't need to worry about that. So start with a workpiece that's not too long and avoid going too deep. So now I've been practicing this and I feel like I've got that down. You know, I've got half of a ball. But what about the left side? Every one of these exercises should be practiced as a right and a left. Um, now, I wish I was ambidextrous because I would just switch around and do it this way. And that way, everything would be symmetrical. I would do this, 
so I do this. That would also be very handy playing pool. <laughs> but I mean, some of the best professional players shoot right and left-handed equally well. Um, I think ambidexterity is something that hardwired in your brain. You either got it or you don't. I don't know. This is just my theory. Um, I can't do anything uh, left-handed. And I stopped trying. I did try for a while. They didn't try hard enough. But, what, but if you want to do the left-handed, the first thing you want to do is, is keep yourself away from the spur center. You don't want to hit the spur center with the tool. So create a, a working space here. Create a working space by just trying to achieve some depth. Um, so you have somewhere to go. And now you're just going to leave this part alone, and you're not going to go anywhere near the spur center. So let's see if we can get some depth and get down to that half of the diameter. And now I'm ready to practice this, this shape on this side. Now for a right-handed person, doing the left side is harder because here I was moving the handle away from my body so I could move my handle out into space or I can swing myself over like that. Um, this is one of those cases where you really have to detach your hand from your ribs and, and do that. Now on this side, for, you know, for a right-handed person, I'm bringing the handle toward my body. So as I come around, all of a sudden my hand hits my ribs. So something, something wrong. So I either have to get out of the way. Okay? Now there are some turners who stand back and pass the chisel in front. I don't really like that method. I don't feel very comfortable this way. <coughs> some people saw the end of the chisel off and they hold it here. And that way they can pass it in front of themselves without standing back too much. Um, so what I like to do is, I know you can't see this, but I take my left foot and I put it off to the side as I begin. So as I get to that point, I can shift my weight onto my left foot. I don't have to shuffle my feet in the middle of the cut because I've already planned for it by putting my left foot over here. So my left foot is now sort of in line with the middle of the headstock. And as I come around, I can get my body completely out of the way, right, without having to move my feet during the cut. Now, one of the things that has happened here is that this is now running out a little bit. That's uh, probably because this tree was leaning, so there's a stress in the wood. And as I cut into it, it's, it's deflecting. Um, oh, oh wood, whether the tree was leaning or not, oh, wood can deflect if you cut into it. Now, it's very important on these uh, exercises where you start with the double rubbing, it's very important that the wood that you begin the cut has to be running perfectly true because it's, see the other word, bouncing? So if my chisel is bouncing as I begin the cut, that bouncing is gonna continue all the way down to the bottom. It's not gonna correct itself because the chisel is being controlled by the rubbing devil, which is always rubbing on that thing that's bouncing. So as you proceed, if you, if you perceive that the wood is bouncing like that, then just go back here and, and fix it. Just screw it up. You know, just the last inch there. So that the surface of the wood where you initiate the cut is running perfectly true. That will give you a good start every time. So here I'm moving my feet and I'm starting here. Okay, now we're practicing the, the left side, which is harder than the right side. And one of the things that makes it harder is that as you move, as a, for a right-handed person, as I move my body out of the way, I'm no longer seeing the curve in profile. I'm now looking at it this way. So I'm, my, my point of view is not uh, in the plane of the cutting circle anymore. Um, so sometimes you have to come back over here and get a look at it you know, straight on to see if you've actually accomplished the, the curvature that you want. So that's kind of a heavy cut. All right. Okay, so that's the first exercise. And that's called the ball shape, and uh, showing you how to practice that right and left. And so you see that with this method of practicing, you can literally get a couple of hundred practice strokes out of a simple piece of wood that you got in the firewood pile. And this is how we learn. Right. So that's uh, that's called the ball shape.
Okay. So what's the what's the next exercise? And I'm going to keep using the same piece of words just to save time. Um, the next the next shape is called the bottle, and um, the reason I'm using that as a second exercise is because both the ball and the bottle start out exactly the same. They start out with the bevel rubbing at the top of the curve, tangent to the curve. The thing about the bottle is that it gets halfway down and it reverses. Right, so we're, we're looking for that, and I'll show you what that looks like. So initially, I'm going to have to remove some wood to try to uh, get the thing working. Here we go. This is the bottle. And you notice that I'm, I'm trying to come out at that diameter. And, and like I say, resist the temptation of going deeper each time, because you don't want your core to get too thin. You see where this is running out now? Like I'm having this problem repeatedly because this tree was leaning. <laughs> but I can deal with it, and I'm just going to chew that up so that the the wood that I'm initiating the cut is running through, and that helps me get a good start. So you start out like like the ball, but then when you get halfway down, you reverse the process. So I'm going around like the ball, and then I start to reverse, and I start to turn the chisel back up towards ball the clock and swing the handle to the right instead of uh, to my left instead of to my right. Let me see if I can see around this a little bit more. Yeah. So you see why this is called a bottle? It's like the neck of a bottle. And you can practice this a hundred times on the same piece of wood. Let's do it on the left side. You know, there's a rule that you should never move the tool rest with the work piece rotating. It's a very good rule. <laughs> I don't always <laughs> obey it. I would say that if you have a square piece of wood or any part of the work piece is square, then it's especially a very good rule. <laughs> um, that's where you're rough around the spindle. Yeah, I once had a four foot diameter work piece. And I tried to move, actually, I had a floor standing for this. And I tried to move it. And the corner of this, sometimes, you know, this, I don't know, it was sharp enough that it embedded in the wood and it snapped the tool rest off right at the neck. And as it went tumbling to the floor, it grazed my index finger right here. And that hurt for years. year. Didn't break it, but I had pain in that knuckle for a whole year after that. Plus, I lost the tool rest. And I'm lucky that I, I didn't lose a lot more. Okay, uh, so it's a good rule and I may not obey it all the time. I mean, especially if the work piece is completely round. So, you know, like if I bump into that there, not much happens. But if it were square, a lot would happen. All right, here's the bottle on the left. This See how much running out that is over there. So the wood is reacting because I'm removing material, and so the, the internal stresses are causing it to bounce. Sometimes you get on wet wood. Sometimes you get chips that stick right on the air, and then the chisel won't go there. Down the hill, reverse. About halfway down, you reverse. All right, there's the bottom. All right. Now, you remember when I was starting out with the rough and gouge, and I said that the first part of the chisel that touches the wood is not the edge, but the heel. And that I show you how to bring it up and then raise the handle until the edge engages, and that's the end. Okay. But now forget that. <laughs> because now, in the third exercise, I'm going to show you a cut of where the first part of the chisel that touches the wood is the edge. And this is, um, this is a lot more difficult than the first two exercises. Um, you know, in these exercises, you, uh, because you're starting with the bevel rubbing, there's not a lot that can go wrong initially. 
But when you start with the edge touching first, there are things that can go wrong. I'm gonna do a little demonstration here. So if I take this chisel, I'm gonna hold it back here. <coughs> and if I have it straight up at 12 o'clock and I engage this to the wood, <laughs> It's pretty stable because as the point embeds in there, it's cutting equally on both sides. Right? If I turn it to this angle and engage it, it flies off that way. And if I turn it this way and engage it, it's going to fly off that way. So you might conclude from, by the way, what does that look like? Well, you see this spiral behind down there? So you might conclude from that little demonstration that the only stable position to engage would be straight up and of course there's another position that is stable and that position would be with the chisel up at 90 degrees where the part of the edge that touches the work is exactly tangent to the cutting circle so that would be like this and where the now very often you would use this technique to start the inside of the bowl right okay so this is really no different now a couple of things the part, when I said the part of the edge that touches the work, well, because the edge is a complex curve, the edge is curved this way and it's curved that way. So visualizing exactly what part of the edge is going to touch the work is not that easy. It depends on the height of the tool rest. It depends on the height of the handle. It depends on the rotation of the chisel. It depends on the shape of the grind. All of these factors come together to determine what is the the point where this is going to be stable and not fly off to the left or the right. Um, but if the part of the chisel is tangent to the cutting circle, it will be stable. Now what is a cutting circle? Well, a cutting circle is, okay, here. Whenever the chisel touches the wood, bang, that's the cutting circle, right? Whenever the chisel touches, Something's happening in, in that place. And that place is a circle. It's not just a point, it's a circle. Um, the cutting circle is always perpendicular to the axis. And a circle is a planar object, meaning it always lies in the plane. So the plane of the cutting circle is always perpendicular to the axis. Um, and that's a very important thing to know. And uh, later on, I'll, I'll say a little more about why it's important. So uh, the next exercise is the cold. And to initiate a cold, we need to bring the chisel up so that it makes this piercing cut. I call this the piercing cut. You know, what I, what I was doing before, I call that the sliding entry. And it's sliding because it starts with the bevel rubbing and it sort of slides into the way, the way it initiates itself. But in a piercing entry, the edge literally is making a, a slicing or piercing entry. And then the scooping out is very much like the second phase of the bottle. So the trick, again, the surface upon which you initiate the cut has to be running perfectly through. It really helps. It's not absolutely essential, but it really helps. And notice the starting position of the chisel is over here. And that determines the angle of the cut as it enters. And I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. And it's the opposite of the ball. So there are, now the chisel starting at 3 o'clock, ending up at 12 o'clock, right? And I'm moving the chisel this way instead of that way. So it's exactly the opposite. Um, so I'm sure you can work. So this is this is the angle of the bevel, um, and if I want if I want the um, curve to come up at that angle, I have to have the handle. Let me show you this on on like this. Um, You know, many years ago we had a design symposium, and I was chosen to give a talk on wood turning design. Um, 
spindle turning design. Uh, so one of the points is, so when you have a code, so let's say we have this shape going on, and this is a, this is a classic uh, form that occurs in wood turning. So th this is your center line. Um, so the I'm gonna get a different color. Like, like, oh, no. so there this box. I don't need this. Yes, I do. I want to do this right. Okay. All right. So what I want you to look at is this angle right here and this angle right here. So this is what's called the end point angle. Right? Every curve has a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> and the end of the curve is where the curve terminates. And that, a, a line tangent to the curve at its end point creates a certain angle. Now you can measure that angle from, from the radial line, or you can measure that angle to the axial line. It, do, it doesn't <laughs> But the main thing I want to say is that you need to be very conscious of the end point angles of your curves. You know, this curve also has a, has an end point angle, you know, where, where the beam begins. It's not straight down. It's over about 10 or 15 degrees. And the same thing with the code. It doesn't come right up to a uh, vertical, right? It comes just short of being vertical. But the mistake that, that so many people make is that, that they make codes that are kind of like this. And the problem with that is after you, after you sand it, you see, you, your, sharp, your sharp points are not sharpening. They weren't sharp to begin with. <laughs> and after you sand it, they're really not sharp. Um, I mean, talking about sanding could be a whole nother hour. But I'll just say one thing about sanding. Sand in such a way that these corners become sharper as you sand and not more round. And now exactly how you do that, well, one way to do it is, um, okay, this is called a sanding stick. It's just a tapered stick. I, you know how to make this. So with a, a, sand, with a uh, sandpaper wrapped around a sanding stick, you can go in here and actually make these corners sharper as you see it, right? That's what you're striving for. So that after you're done, all, all the features, I'm gonna show you how to do inside and outside corners, that all those inside and outside corners need to be sharp, crisp, and that's what makes it for quality spindle turn. All right, end point angle. Now, if the end point angle, now back to where I was, if the end point angle is like this, then the chisel has to be, I'm putting the bevel right against that. So this is the position that the chisel has to be to achieve that end point angle, right? Like that. If you started like this, your end point angle would be 40 degrees, would be way too much. You need to be over here. And I'm sure that when you restart your initial cut to the inside of a bowl, you're dealing with exactly the same issue, right? Okay, now. Um, all right, I'm just gonna... And now, <laughs> doing this left-handed means that I have to stand way over here. But finishing the cut is easier because I'm moving the tool away from my body, which is always easier. But starting the tool is harder, you can't see as well. I'm going to show you a little trick. So, as you start, the chisel might run to the right or the left because you didn't get the edge exactly straight. Well, one way would be okay, and the other way would be not okay. You don't want the chisel to run to the right, which would be into the solid material, which may be your finished side. If, so you want to err on the safe side and make sure the chisel is going to run into the open space. So that way I would try to err by rolling the chisel over even more, and that way, see now it won't go in because it keeps running off to the left, and I keep straightening it up a little until it bites. And that's a good way to find that place where you can't actually see very well if the, if 
the edge is tangent to the time series. So initiating this cut is a lot more challenging than the other practice cuts that we were making before, especially the left-handed side like I'm doing now. But once you're in, you know, once you get down to about a, a 32nd or 16th of an inch depth, then it's not going to catch anymore because it's got something leaning. It's just getting to that first 32nd of an inch that's treacherous, where if your edge is leaning too much, it'll catch. And it'll run. Look how much this wood is running out now. So I'm going to go back to, to the rubber mat to fix this. Okay. Now, what what if um what if my wood turning? Oh yeah, I got. I didn't try to save them. You want to save them? Huh? You can save those. Oh, that's okay. Um, what if my wood turning required a, a straight cylindrical or tapered section? Now, in in many wood turning books, most wood turning books would say, in order to make a nice, straight, smooth cylinder, you would take a skew chisel. And with a skew chisel, you would shave away with like this. And the sheer angle of the skew chisel uh, works very well to give you a super smooth finish. <clears throat> and that this is the best way to get a straight, smooth cylinder. And it does give you a very smooth finish if the grain of the wood is perfectly straight and perfectly parallel to the axis. And the workpiece is short and fat, like this one. And that workpiece vibration is not a problem. But very rarely do those circumstances come together. And a skew chisel. You know, in spite of all the books that spend pages and pages telling you how to do this, and all the beginners that have banged their head against the wall trying to learn how to do that, what I just did, that's actually a very useful skill. It's so much easier and so much better to make that surface with a gouge. And this is where um, the shallow, this is like the kind of shallow gouge you can pick up at a yard sale for a dollar. So what I'm gonna do, um, like what Peter Block was talking about, drag cutting. I think Peter invented the term drag cutting. Um, it's it's a, a type of gouge work that I do 90% of the time. Drag cutting simply means, this is not the same as making a ball, where you're pushing the nose of the tool down the hill, or you're pushing the nose of the tool into scooping out into the cone. Drag cutting, is where the handle is ahead of the edge, okay? And I'm moving this way. You see how much easier that is? And it's so stable because if something goes wrong, it just pushes the chisel away, right? Um, you see, this part of the gouge is basically straight anyway, just like this future. And so the effect of this part of the edge, um, is, is, is this as smooth as, as what I obtained with the skew? No, but it's so much easier to control. It works so much better on long thin work, right? Because remember, as I said before, the force on the cutting tool is proportional to the width of the chip. So this gouge chisel having a nose controls the width of the chip. With a skew chisel, you can't control the width of the chip. It's always going to be fairly broad because the edge is straight. Right? Now that straightness looks great on a, on a roughing gun, but not when you're making a finishing cut. Right, so watch this again. So this is, this is drag cutting, you see, because the handle is ahead of the edge, and I'm moving this way. By the way, people who use side grind say that you can't do this without side grind. But I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so if I encounter a knot or a place where the grain is funny, 
I just make a very subtle change and I just rotate a little bit like this. So I'm working more on the curved part. Um, so watch it. So here I'm working on the curved part and I can roll it over to the side and more on there and more like that. Now, the fact that I can rotate the chisel in the middle of the cut and not change the direction of the cut is because I'm not using side grind. Because the side grind, you can't do that because as soon as you rotate the chisel, it goes off in a new direction because the angle is different there. See what I'm getting at? So not using side grind makes wood turning easier. Remember when Peter Block is talking about having a target on the wall that he aimed his chisel at in order to get a certain angle? You can't do that with side grind because every time you turn the chisel, it's at a new angle. These are all the reasons why not to use side grind. Except for certain types of bowl gouging I, I can see. They need a certain advantage. Okay, so the drag cut as, as a finishing cut. This is the method that I use to make, you were looking at my Q shaft. Well, a Q shaft is a half inch at the small end. Um, it's, under, it's about seven eighths at the big end. This is a case of more or less extreme long thin turning. So how do I do that without getting workpiece vibration? It's very easy. I use a half inch gouge and I use this drag cutting method. And because I'm using a gouge with a radius nose, I get a chip that's very narrow. And that narrow chip imparts a very much smaller force to the workpiece. Less force imparted to the workpiece means less vibration. Um, side grind simply means that when, when you sharpen when you sharpen the tool, you're swinging the handle from side to side as you grind. In conventional grinding, like I use, you simply rotate. So you know, I don't know if you all use a kind of belt machine, but sure by now Peter's talking about that. Um, <laughs> so there's the setup. And you know, that's that, the buffing. Okay, that's the seven second sharpening that I use uh, all the time. Right. So like and when you do that, it, it takes off example, about. Hmm? You know, like an Ellsworth grinding an Ellsworth gouge, for example. Right, you have to clamp that thing on. Right. Right, which takes a long time. Right. It has to be precisely the distance from yeah. the end. And then that side. Yeah. You know, Ellsworth's a brilliant guy. By the way, a great tool <laughs> Who also <laughs> plays with, with cues that he made himself. <laughs> um, but I don't use side grind, so I disagree with him on that. Uh, okay, now. So I've shown you one of the uses of the skew chisel, and I've told you you don't even have to learn how to do it. So she should be very happy now. <laughs> you're, that, that, you're that far ahead of the oh, yeah. game because you don't even have to practice that. But here's what you do have to practice. So, if you're going to do a long, those were finishing cuts. Yes. Yes. Okay. But if you if you're going to do a long table, we have that with the chair player, and I would use my roughing gouge. Yeah. To get it fit. And boy, that's a nice. Oh, to, to get a to get a finished curve with a roughing gouge. Yes. Yes, you can it's get it up. You know, take the tape. Yes. Um, as long as your work pieces aren't too long or too flexible. Mm -hmm. You know, um, modern, a lot of the modern roughing gouges are not really made correctly. A lot of the modern roughing gouges, they go straight for a certain distance and then they go into their curve and then they go straight. So from here to here and from here to here, they're essentially straight. And then in the middle, they're circular. And that's not the correct way to make a roughing gouge. A roughing gouge should actually be like, piece of a pipe you know absolutely circular from end to end um but a lot of turners point out and and i have to admit it's true that with this type of a, of a roughing gouge you can roll it up on the side and use this little straight part as like a uh, no not straight <laughs> oh god no yeah. but you use it use it like i was um like a skew chisel because it's straight and take very fin not like finishing cuts and of course, that works very well if the work pieces are not vibrating. <laughs> you know, in, in furniture work, work piece vibration is almost always a problem. And the last thing I'm going to do for you today 
when I eventually get there. If, if I got a time limit where I actually have to fit inside of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how much how much more time do we have? All right. Because the last uh, the last thing I want to show you is um, yeah. yeah. The last thing I want to show you is about how to use a steady rate yeah. to combat workpiece vibration. Where can you get one of those? Oh, I have some of them. They're actually, you know, I, I stopped making those. That this wasn't profitable. But I'm going to show you what I use, and you can make them. Or you can. Have a machine. Actually, if there's enough interest in those, I will. I'll get another batch. But I haven't made steady rest for long. All right. Um. Okay. So here's what you do have tonight. We have the skew chisel, and we're going to come to a very important exercise. So if you don't use a skew chisel for planing cylindrical forms, then what do you use a skew chisel for? You use a skew chisel to make piercing cuts, like V cuts, okay? So here we go. So, all right. So with the chisel straight up like this, I'm gonna enter the work like that. Now, you can only go a very small distance using that because the chips have nowhere to go. And the, the toe of the ski chisel being so long and skinny is very fragile and will overheat very easily. So when you when you do that, you almost make it a little punch and you pull it out. But in order to make this into a V cut, I'm gonna start about a 32nd of an inch on this side and meet the first cut. So now I've chopped out that one. And now from the left, like that. And every time you do this, there'll be a little pause at the bottom, especially with wet wood. And each time you do this, you're going deeper and deeper, taking about a 30 second of an inch each time. Now, how much you take each time depends on the hardness of the wood. You know, in time, you could take more than 30 seconds. You could probably even take 16. Um, this is maple, but it's wet, so it's softer than, you know, say dry maple. <clears throat> but I would say shoot for about a 32nd of an inch each time. And this is what you see. Uh, uh, there's no gouge that will work all the way down to a sharp V. So, so to get a clean inside corner, um, this is where the skew chisel is indispensable. There's no other tool that will do it as well. Try to keep this symmetrical, you know, which is very often when I show beginners how to do this, they end up with V's that are like this. Well, I call that right-handed syndrome. In other words, you tend to make this one more like that and this one more straight because you're bumping into your body. So, so be aware of that and make sure when you go over here to do this cut that you step a little bit to the side so that your body is not in the way of the handle. So this is a V cut, and you know, but when you're first practicing this, you know, you may want to start out, like I was saying before, just doing multiple cuts, just keep doing this. But I will say that when you practice this, it's almost, it's almost too easy doing the same side each time. What you need to practice is resetting the tool correctly each time. And now I'm going to turn the lathe up and we'll talk about how you bring the tool up to the work at the correct angle. Um, and I'm going to do it like this so you can see better. Or, or can you see it here with your camera? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Right. See, I'm not used to having this excellent camera right here. So remember when I made that very first cut, I had the chisel straight up and I just poked it in. But that's the only time that the chisel is literally straight up. When I make the cut on this side, <coughs> Um, there's three things that you have to do. One is that the angle of the V has to be somewhat greater than the angle of the chisel. So if this is 40 degrees, looking at it this way, right, then this has to be like 50 degrees. Okay? And the reason that the V has to be wider than the tool is because if it weren't, uh, 
you wouldn't be able to make headway uh, because you, you, you get to the bottom, it would just stop. You, see, each cut has to be deeper than the one before. So it's like this, 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 this. If you've ever chopped down a tree with an ax, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You go from above, from below, from above, from below. And that's exactly how this works. And it's very analogous to chopping down a tree because we're, we're working uh, uh, with axial grain. Right, so it is, it is a tree, it is. Okay, now, so that's the first thing. So how do you achieve that? Well, you achieve that so that when you're cutting the right side, you have the chisel about 10 degrees to the right. And when you're cutting the left side, you got the chisel about 10 degrees to the left. And that'll create a V that's, you know, 15 or 20 degrees wider in angle than the angle of the chisel. All right, that's, that's the first thing. Now, the second thing is when you cut, this, the chisel is not straight up. So to cut this side, now I'm over 10 degrees. Now I'm rotating the chisel that way, right? Not straight up, it's rotated. Um, now, I, can the camera see where my fingernail is? Yeah. Right okay. So see where this little space where my fingernail is? So that, you, you never want the edge to actually touch here, <laughs> because if it does, all hell will break loose. <laughs> But you want to maintain a small space right where my fingernail is. And you see how my chisel is rotated to that point. <clears throat> if you tried to do this with the chisel straight up, it would go part way in and then it would hop out of the cut and fall to the bottom. It won't, it won't follow its nose the way it should. Okay. So now on the left side, I'm 10 degrees to the left and I'm rotated to the left. And I'm maintaining that little space right there, again, where my nail is. That's about the amount of space that you want. So basically, you're just with the point. Yes. Yes. That's why it doesn't pay to have a two inch wide scooch in it because you're only using one eighth of an inch of it. <laughs> um, and what's the third trick? The third trick is to take the correct thickness of shading. That is to, to uh, start the chisel at exactly the right point to try to get about a 30 second of an inch. Uh, that varies again with the hardness of the wood. Okay, so number one, uh, uh, the, v has to, the, the V has to be wider than the chisel, so you have this right side, left side. Number two, rotating to the right, rotating to the left, but not too much. And number three is to start the chisel in the correct way. So now that I've talked about it, I'm going to do again the same, the same stuff. You see how much the wood's deflected again. See, so wood doesn't normally deflect this much as you turn it, but I believe this is happening because the tree I was using is, is a, a leaning. You know where the pith is off center in the tree because the tree was leaning? That's where you get this kind of thing happening. All right, so let's do it again from here. First punch, and I say punch because I'm trying to get across the idea that it's a very fast. Because if you dwell in there, especially with dry wood, you could overheat the pump. Right? And now to the right. Right? That was kind of a big pump. You know, if you take an equal amount from the right and the left, when you get to the bottom, you should be in the same location as you were where you started. And this can be important when you're doing duplication. Right? And on the last cut, you go very slow and you'll get really an excellent finish. And there's always a little something at the bottom, and sometimes you can just knock it out like that and then call it done. All right, so that's, that's the V cut. Oh, I guess I should show you one other thing, which is that uh, a V cut doesn't, I'm talking about keeping the V cut symmetrical. Well, I think when you initially practice, you know, but you might want the V-cut to not be symmetrical. It's possible for one side to be <clears throat> vertical. So that it starts out the same way. And, you know, it, it really means you're cutting almost entirely from one side. So there's the vertical cut. Now, when you're cutting from the side, you need to lean over even more than you did before. This is a little bit harder. 
but it's something you might have to learn to do. So you see how I'm creating a, a square end there. And then always, if you're doing a square end, you always stay a little inside your line. Like if you have a pencil line, generally you'll have a pencil line that you're working to there. And always stay a little bit outside your line until you get to the kind of the depth that you want. And then the final cut would be right here like this. That, that cleans that up and gives you the square, the square end. That's the, the square cut. Um, it's not very often you have to make a square cut like that. Uh, but the V could be that way and then it could be that way. It could be anywhere, actually. If you wanted to make that um, round on both sides, you know, you have the two Vs, but you have a piece in the middle. If you wanted to round it off. Well, that's a good question. Do, do you, like, you know, if you did have that situation that I was talking about, <clears throat> where you have a bead meeting another bead, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let's say here, here's your surface that you're beginning with. So is it a good way to start out by making a V there and then just rounding over? Uh, that is one way. And um, I have decided that that's not the best way. That the best way is to, is to round these over first with a gouge just like I showed you the yep. first exercise, the ball shape. And with the gouge, you end up with a shape here where it's kind of raggedy at the bottom because you can't, uh, you can't really get a sharp view with the gouge. And then at that point, I would stop and, and pick up the skew chisel and just knock that out. You know, it's a, uh, I'm gonna show you that actually in the, the final exercise before the steady wrestling. Um, I can show you that right now, actually, very quickly. Uh, okay, so to do this with the gouge, you see how I'm working left and right. This is very similar to making a bead with it, but I'm, I'm getting the, the roundness of the bead from the top with a gouge. And by the way, I don't, I never cut beads with a skew chisel. Uh, that's real, and again, this, in a lot of wood turning books, they spend pages and pages and pages trying to show you how to do this. That is really the hard way. This is the easy way. So you can't, you can't get to the bottom, but you don't need to get to the bottom yet. What you want to worry about is, the nice thing about doing this with a gouge is, is the ability to round over the tops smoothly is so much easier with a gouge than with a skew chisel. So I'm rounding over the top, going for some depth here. And all you gotta make sure is that this corner doesn't crash into the other side. But, all right, so I, I end up with that. And then I just take this and I, uh, Stuff stuck in there. Okay. And now I'm just going to do this. I have to break that in half. Okay. Here. And just finish it up like that. So I mean, I love the idea of doing the whole thing with a skew chisel right down to the bottom and just using one tool to do it all. I think in theory that's wonderful, but in practice it's really the hard way. So this is, this is how I do it. Um, all right, we're moving right along. Any questions about, I, I, there's not much to pass around here. It's sort of an ugly thing, but there it is. Um, it's still cold, well, we're out all night. So I'm gonna do one more demonstration and then I'm gonna do the, then I'll talk about duplication a little bit, and then I'm going to do a steady rest. The last thing I'll do is a steady rest demo. Okay. Um, all right. 
new piece of wood. Can you put the camera up a little bit here? Just up a little bit. Beautiful, thank you. Like I said, when you put a log on, don't, you don't have to fuss with it too much. I mean, it's only, uh, it's not round. So it doesn't actually have a center. So don't don't drive yourself crazy trying to find the center because it doesn't really have one. Very solid. Here, how much does this lay weigh? Fifteen. Huh? Fifteen. Fifteen hundred pounds? Well, you're gonna vibrate it. No, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I can tell you from experience, take the gap out, you put a twenty-four inch bull blank in there and it doesn't have to be too balanced. <laughs> I cut this down thinking it was soft maple, but it's hard maple. But it turns real nice. And I like cutting trees in the winter. They don't have as much water in them. Sometimes when, when I cut trees in the summer for these demos, they're so wet. And the chips are so stringy that they just keep wrapping around the work. So I'm going to do a uh, an exercise which is a little different, and I'm going to show you what I'm going to do on the board before I actually do it. So we have an idea where we're going with this. Um, I like the blue. Where's my blue? You see what I drew here? This is this is what I'm going to make. Uh, draw this here. Okay. So it looks like this. <clears throat> so we have this order of the bead and a little straight shoulder. A lot of people call that a fillet, but I think a fillet is a concave curve thing. The correct name for this feature is cincher, which simply means a binding or a band. So it's a term from architecture. So we have the bead, the cincher, and the code. Bead, cincher, and code. This combination of, uh, of details is uh, what makes uh, is the foundation of all classic wood turning design. And where does it come from? Well, if you've ever been to Greece or Rome and looked at the ruins, 
uh, you'll see that the column bases, all the column bases, um, you know, they, they start like this, they go around, they do this, and then you have the first speed, and then that, and then a cove, cove and come, this one comes out further than that, and then you have the bottom, and that sits on a, a plinth. A, a plinth is simply a square part. So now you have cincher, cincher, and you might have one here. So this type of base is, uh, is called the attic base. Uh, it was used in, um, from the Tuscan columns all the way through to the Iatic and the Corinthian columns used this. And then the Romans took it up and, and copied the Greek style. And so almost all column bases have some variation of this. And, and so what this is based on is the, the bead, the cincture, the cold, the cincture, and the bead. So the large bead at the bottom is, is called the torus, um, and, and then it steps back to a smaller one. And that, that's where all, all classic wood turning design actually evolves from that. Hard to believe, but true. So let's see if we can pull this off. Uh, yes, I have turned a lot of columns. Oh, that's a very good question. They used, um, they rotated the pieces as a kind of a jig to, uh, to gauge the work. But the cutting was all done like this. But the way that they got it round was by rotating it to a fixed template. Right? Sort of what, what potters would call a jigger. Where, you know, um, so, uh, and that's, that's how they got, like the columns were, especially the Greeks had, Tom's that were like in wafers stacked up one of them. So you get them all round, they have to be perfectly round or they wouldn't like fit. And I'm sure that they smoothed them out after they stacked them up. All right, do I want, okay, I'm gonna start with, starting with the half inch gouge. If I was stuck on a desert island with only one chisel, <laughs> it would be the half inch spindle gouge. The most versatile of all of the spindle turning tools. Because you can do everything with a gouge except the sharp V, the sharp inside corner. Right, so the first step is, is when I'm making a little stuff. In the first step, what I'm attempting to do is to rough out like this and get down below this line. So I need to get down below that. So I'm using a squiggly line here to indicate that this is roughing. So that's the first step is to get down below, below the line of the cincture. equalize things a little bit even though I'm just roughing out here but you know as I do this I, I might slide in like this or I might pierce in like that depending on how steep I want to begin. So I'm trying to keep the low point halfway between the pencil marks. But this is still just roughing out. By keeping that low point halfway between the pencil marks, it just uh, it gives me a good head start for everything coming out symmetrically. Okay. That's enough. Now, uh, I could continue with a half inch. I think I'm going to switch to a three eighths here. So where the pencil line is, that's the part I don't want to touch at all until the very end, essentially. And I can see the workpiece running out, so I will have to take a little bit off the top to true this up. And, and 
I want to leave those pencil marks as much as I can because that's kind of my reference. Of course, you know, I made the pencil mark by eye. I didn't measure them. <laughs> so where they are, it's a little ambiguous anyway. Okay. I can see Mark now. You can see what I mean about rounding the top of the bead with your scout. It's so much easier than doing that with a stitching. Okay, come right across the top like that and go right into there. Now comes the interesting part. All right, well, this one's a little higher than that one. That doesn't look too good. Let me just fix that. All right, so I got, I got the thing kind of started, you know, in, in the steps of making any kind of design. You always start at the top. You start with your larger diameter. So, like I said, you're always uh, cutting from the larger diameter towards the smaller diameter. So, the other thing is that in terms of the uh, strength and the vibration of the workpiece, you don't want to cut into the bottom diameters straight away. You want to leave that thickness there to give you more more strength of the workpiece until the very end uh, for stability. So. I, you know, you're shaping, I'm shaping the tops of the beads um, down to the point where the cincher is. So I've got that part done. And now comes the interesting part. Um, yeah, here. So I'm going to use a skew chisel now. You could do this with, you could do this with a, a regular type of skew chisel. 
I'm going to use my little round skew chisel for this because I, I just love this chisel for doing a small detail. And what I'm going to do now is use this chisel to create the sharp inside corners. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, the sharp inside corner next to the bead. So this can be a little tricky because I have to introduce this cut. And what I'm doing is I'm touching the bevel, then I twist a little bit and I try again and I twist a little bit and I try again. And at some point I'm gonna see a chip emerging from the tip of the chisel and then I know I'm at the right end. So starting like that. And there's a, there's a chip right there and I pierce in and make a slice. And now I'm gonna come in from the side and meet that cut. Now, you all know why you have to do the down cut first before you do the side cut. Because it's the slicing cut that severs all the grain of the wood. Um, if you tried to come in from the side first, it would just frizz up all that wood and it wouldn't actually break away. So, and you can still see a little remnant of the down cut there. Um, it's not bad to even leave that, especially on work that's going to be painted. It gives the paint a place to go. But um, <laughs> in furniture work with more natural finish, you, you kind of take one more cut until that disappears. Like that. Okay, let's say that one's done. All right, now same thing here. Like it in. Over. Okay. You know, when fussing with little detail is generally a, a big part of spindle turning and especially furniture work. And if you look at some of the pieces that I brought that I put over there, you'll see that some of these balusters. Um, really have a lot of detail in them. So it's an important part of spindle turning is fussing with details and getting them accurate. Okay, we're getting there. So as I'm as I'm making that little side cut, what I first do is I, I lay the bevel on there, I can feel the bevel on there, and I gradually pull the chisel back in, until it starts to cut. And then I move to the side and come in. Some some traders call that coming in from air, meaning you're starting out with the chisel in midair. And come here. Yeah. Well, this chisel doesn't have a, a tore oh, heel. It's well, it's got a minute roundness, so that in a way, both corners are a slightly heel, yeah. because there's a little tiny roundness. To it. But you know, you could, if you were doing this with an ordinary skew chisel, you'd make the down cut with the toe <laughs> and then the cross cut with the heel. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, did I actually do? So I start with the bevel hitting there and then get the feel for that angle and then come in from air, coming in from the side. I think there's a little knot right there. All right, so now the final thing, the final thing is just to complete the coat. So the trick here is to get all of the cinchers to be the same width. Uh, if doing this in a hurry like I am, I, they may not all come up the same. Here's that chair cut. There. And so you see, I'm doing the details starting at the top and working toward the bottom. Mm -hmm. and so I'm not really weakening the work piece unnecessarily at the early stage. Oh, 
always working down toward the bottom. So once your chisel reaches the bottom, you don't continue up the other side. You stop dead as soon as you get to the middle. Because if you start to continue up the other side, you're cutting a frame, right? That's like sharpening the pencil up. So you see, this didn't come out exactly the right size. This one's definitely smaller. I mean, I could still fix that by moving this over a little bit. I think it's I think it's this one that's too wide. <laughs> okay. Uh, it can be boring if I fuss too much with this, so I'm going to say it's good enough. I have a little problem here and there. Um, you know, a lot of these little problems <coughs> would, be, would be fixed. Um, so if I, if I wrap sandpaper around this, see the great thing about a taper, paper dowel is much better than a straight dowel because you can you can work it up and down until you find that place where it's going to fit just right. Um, where the straight dial, you don't, you don't have the variation that you need to get it right. You know, in there. Um, all right. I see little problems, but I'll uh, spend more time on it. And this is the exercise I call putting it all together. So we put together all, your, all the different skills to create that. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start setting up this uh, steady wrist, but while I do, I'm going to talk to you about duplication. Um, there's not a lot that I can demonstrate in duplication, but I'm going to talk and give you some pointers. Um, the most important thing you need to know about duplication, first of all, before I get into it, there's two kinds of duplication. <laughs> One kind is where someone walks in the door and has a broken chair leg and said, can you make me one of these? So you put, you put the two pieces together and you see that they're, maybe you might glue them together so that you have, and then you copy that exactly. You are duplicating the sample that was given to you. The other kind of duplication is someone says, make me a table. Uh, so well, what kind of legs? Oh, you design the legs. Okay, so now I can design the legs. I can make them any way I want. I have to make four that look alike. <laughs> so you see, they're two different challenges, right? You, you don't have to make it look like any particular thing, but they have to look like each other. And you notice that at no point am I saying that you're making them all alike, that you're making them look alike. But how close do they actually have to be? Well, that depends on how far apart they are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a, a balusters where you can have three balusters on each step, and they're only that far apart, then uh, very small differences would be noticed. But on a table where they're that far apart, it's amazing how much you can get away with, right? In terms of not, them not being, what are the critical factors in, in sameness or similitude? Is that the bottoms of the cones should all be the same diameter, you know? And then all your major diameters. Of course, measuring things out axially, that should be pretty straightforward. And I'm gonna show you how I do that. So I have, Oh yeah. <clears throat> so this this is called a mark. These are called marking sticks. Now some people call this a story stick. Now a story stick is simply just a stick with lines drawn on it. This is more than a story stick. This has physical indentations in it. So you bring this up to the work. See, in this case, I brought this up against a, a pommel. That's an interesting thing. What is a pommel? Pommel is the square part of a table leg or a furniture part, right? That's the square part that you put the mortise in there. But almost all furniture has some part of the turning that's still square. All right. Am I running out of time? Right, I do, I'm going to do one more thing. Um, 
Yeah, I think we said so. Okay. So, yeah, what was I showing you before this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there. No, that's not there. Okay. So, yeah, the pommel is the part that you leave square. Now, most furniture has some part that's left square, and there might be more than one. And if you look at, um, so down there on the table is an ash leg with some mortises in it. An ash leg. No, not the not the Dutch foot. There. Yeah. Okay. Let me bring that. See, that's a good example. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put this up. <clears throat> see, I, I knew I was gonna let's see this way. I knew I was gonna do this exercise and I kind of forgot. But that's all right. We have time. This will only take a minute. Um, all right. Well, this is a typical this is a typical leg that has more than one pommel. It has this one, which is where the apron, see this is mortise, this is where the apron and the tip. You know that when you build a table, the legs don't actually attach to the top. The legs attach to each other uh, by way of pieces called apron. Right? So these are the mortises where the apron goes. But this type of table also has a bottom rail. And in this case, the mortise is in the middle because it's what's called an H stretcher. Right? So the piece comes into the middle and then the, okay. So sometimes there's a lot of uh, transitions. This is called the transition cut. The transition cut is the cut that you make between the square part and the round part. And this is a, a very tricky thing for a lot of beginners. And this is the exercise that I forgot, but I'm gonna make up for it and do it very quickly now. Um, and you remember we talked about making V cuts and um, the transition cut is exactly the same as a V cut. But, and remember what were the three tricks involved in making a V cut? One was giving yourself the wiggle room, you know, with the width. Uh, and the second was the tipping of the chisel. And the third one was starting the chisel in the right place to get the correct thickness of shade. Now it's that third thing that is much harder when you're cutting in from the square because you can't actually see where you're placing the chisel as easily as you can on a round piece. So that's what makes, the, the, the process is exactly the same as the V cutting I was doing before. But because the placement of the chisel is so much harder each time, this is a somewhat harder exercise. But if you want to make furniture, you must master this, unless you're making Windsor chairs or anything in the Windsor style, because that was, because in the Windsor style, I already mentioned, the Bodgers are out in the woods splitting out their blanks. So there is no square part, right? So in the Windsor style, there was no square. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, to begin with, you almost always have, um, you always have a line that you're working. So, just to be realistic, I'm going to make a line so that you'll see exactly how it, how it is. Now, do you have to draw this on all four sides? No, but the more side you draw it on, the easier it's going to be to see it. And just so that you all can see it, I'm going to draw this on all four sides. All right. The other thing is that, remember I talked about a cutting circle and how a circle is a planar figure, it falls in a plane is perpendicular to end. Well, a square is also a planar figure, although a square can be twisted. Um, but in this case, this, this, if the workpiece is square, this is truly square. So the square lies in a plane. And when you look at the square, you need to have your eyeballs in that plane. So like where you're sitting, I'm going to turn this on. Now you can see that, that line very clearly. But from where you're sitting, you can't see that. I want you to stand up and walk over here. And as you do so, keep your eye on that line. More, 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 more. Now, all of a sudden, it's very sharp. So from the side, it's very fuzzy and hard to tell where it is. But if you has got your eyes right in line with that um, plane, it appears very sharp. So now when you make the V, you do this exactly the same way 
as I was making the V in the round. Uh, but you got to be much more careful about placing the chisel. And if things are going to go wrong, they're going to go wrong right in the beginning because that's where you're going to chip those very fragile corners, right? So you, you go very carefully in the beginning. I'm taking extremely light cuts from each side and <laughs> feeling and listening as much as I'm looking because you really can't see very much. You, you kind of have to go on feel and sound. So at this point, I've started out. Now I want my V to be right on the pencil line. I guess I'm there. And as I proceed down, I keep aiming at that pencil line. So as I get down toward the bottom, I'm, I haven't uh, drifted off to the right or drifted off the left because in duplication, you know, it's very important that you have the length of your palm will be consistent. Notice that none of these corners are chipped off. They're, they're clean, and, and that's, that's important. I'm going to continue this all the way home. So I can bring the chisel over until it touches, then pull back, move over 30 seconds, and go down. And instead of relying on my eyes, I'm going by feel. And that's the feeling where the wood is. <laughs> and these little muscles in your hand that allow you to do that, that's how you control the movement of the chisel. Whereas I get it where I want, and then I keep I just do this and it moves 30 seconds a minute. So I said, bring it up to touch, pull back, and then go in a little bit more. And each time I'm aiming at that pencil line, because I want to keep the pencil line at the bottom. <laughs> the other thing to realize is that 90% of the time, only <laughs> one side matters, and the other side can be rough. Because on a pommel, I'm only concerned about this surface. I mean, the other surface is all getting roughed away. So you really only have to sweat one particular side of it. And how do you know when you've gone far enough? Well, it's very hard to know. Sometimes you have to stop it and look. But usually, again, that's where this type of spur center is very valuable. But usually you can feel the smoothness of the suddenly the cut, you're not hearing that intermittent cut. It becomes very smooth and it's pretty obvious. I have just broken through. There's my pencil line, right? So there when I hit the pencil line exactly. I guess the pencil lines are more light up with each other perfect. So what, what I really need here is just one more cut from this side. There, I guess I'll take one more. You know, what's good about this is that none of these corners are chipped. I got a very clean, crisp line. And the other thing that's good about it is that the surfaces are very clean and do not require sanding. And that's very important because you can't sand it. You can't. If you attempt to sand that surface, you're just going to wreck it. Well, it, it's, it, what it's going to do is it's going to blunt the crispness of that, of that intersecting line. So this intersecting line here should be crisp and look really sharp like that. Um, and if you tried to sand this, you would destroy that crispness of that. So this, this curve here, it looks like a circular curve. It's actually hyperbolic. Right? It's the intersection of a plane parallel to the axis of a cone. So this is a cone, and this is a plane parallel to the axis. So the curve that's generated there is a hyperbola. Um, good. So more, I, I, I had forgotten that's one of the exercises. All right, and um, back to duplication. The most important thing you need to know about duplication is to break the job up into small steps. Don't try to do the whole leg at once. So let's say this was the leg I'm working on. Um, you know, a lot of people hesitate to remove the workpiece from the lathe 
um, before it's done. And they attempt to do the entire leg and the sanding and everything before they remove it because they feel that if they tried to put it back, it wouldn't run through, it would be wobbly. Well, this is the result of faulty centers. And if your lathe centers don't run true, and you can't get the work to run perfectly true when you remove it and replace it, or you remove it and turn it in for in, then there's something wrong with your centers and you need to fix them. Because you should be able to remove the piece and put it back or turn it in for in an infinite number of times and have it always return to exact center without fuss and without worry every time. And if you don't have that, you're working at a great disadvantage and you need to fix your center so that you do have that. And you don't necessarily have to have this kind of a spur center with the spring, but what that allows you to do is to remove the work piece and put another one in or remove it and turn it end for end and have it always return to perfect centering every time without fussing with it or adjusting it or whatever. That's very important. So now that you've removed the, the problem of taking the piece out and putting it back in, or taking it out and putting in a different one, and having it be centered each time. That's no longer a worry. So you would, you would put the piece in, it would have, this piece would have three lines drawn on the square, here, here, and here, just like I have that line drawn on there. I'd make those V cuts, and maybe I would rough out this and rough out this into a cylinder. Then I'd take that off and get the next one. Right? And I'd do that four times. Well, at least four times. Yeah. Um, Maybe five? Well, I'll get into that in a minute. My first point is about breaking the job up into small steps, and then I'm going to come to this other thing. And then, secondly, always start in the middle. And or, always start with the hard part. Always start with the hardest part. Because, I mean, this is not just a psychological factor. Um, the hardest part means the part with all the little details. And by attacking the part with all the little details, like I would start with this part here, or maybe from here to here. Um, remember that workpiece vibration is always the enemy right, that you're, which you're working against. The amplitude of vibration is always the greatest in the middle. But you can get more stability if you still have all of this thick material on this side and all this thick material on this side. You haven't cut any of that away yet. So you're gonna have greater stability as you go into the hard part, which may or may not be right in the middle. But at any rate, do the hard part first. That means the part with all the detail. While well, you've still got meat on both sides to stabilize and add mass to the workpiece to prevent a lot of vibration. So in the first step, I would, I would probably go from here, maybe through the ball, um, or maybe I'd go all the way up to the bottom of the center figure. So I would only do this, so I'd have, I'd only really need one, I'd have, I'd have two caliper settings. I'd have one caliper setting for the bottom of this, the, the height of the cinchers, I would guess, those aren't that critical. It's, it's the, the depth at the bottom of the coves is critical. And then I would have one caliper setting for this bottom V. Now, how do you caliper the bottom of a V? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, with a special, with a special caliper that is, has the points brown. Let's see, how can I get the camera to see this? Okay? Yeah. So the points are brown there, not real razor sharp, but enough so that that will fit into this V. And, but one thing about these calipers is that you don't use these calipers with the workpiece rotating like you can with the other calipers because they tend to jam into the V. So this is special calipers for, for gauging the diameter of a V. But you don't have to do that often, but um, when you do, yeah. so I would just, so I would do this part and I would, see, when you try to do the whole thing, you got so many calipers set, it's very easy to grab the wrong one and make possibly a fail mistake. So when you do a little bit at a time, you have less chisels set up, you have fewer calipers, uh, you have fewer tools and you have fewer things on your mind and you can develop a rhythm uh, of doing it. Now I take that out, put the next one on and I just do that part. I take that off and I do that part. And by the time I get to the third one, you know, I'm really rolling and I, and I got everything. All right, so then um, this in, in the next phase, I would maybe do from here to here or maybe do this part. 
uh, and I do that four times. And then I would have the same caliper set for here and here because these diameters are the same. Uh, that would probably be the only caliper I need um, to do that. And do the foot last. Well, why do the foot last? Well, because the foot is so near the center that you're not going to have any workpiece vibration while you're doing the foot. So that's why you save it for last. So you try to do the middle first because you, you have a better chance of coping with the workpiece <clears throat> vibration by doing the middle first. So you're breaking the job up into small steps. This really aids in duplication because as you create each shape, as you do each step, um, you're only thinking about a very small number of steps, uh, 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 operations in each step. Uh, and it helps you with your duplication. Um, the marking gauge. So in this case, so I would, this isn't the right one for here. But anyway, so I, I would bring this edge right up against the pommel while it's turning and lay my pencil into these grooves and, and make all the marks. So that way, by marking the pieces off this way, um, you're not going to make any mistakes in measurement. You know, and I should point out that, um, oh, so also on the table, there's that um, high boy leg, the one I showed you last month, that has a little piece of wood sticking out of it. Bring that guy up. So I just want to show you, before I, that's the one, yeah. So of course, on, on a high boy, there were, there were six legs. High boys have six legs, right? So there were six of these. And so before I made that, um, I made the drawings. And I don't really have time to really show you about how to make the drawings. But I'll just point out that um, when you make drawings, you make, you make full-size drawings. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, if you make a scale drawing, then you can't actually measure off the drawing. Right? So, so what I, what I, once you have a drawing like this, so the way I make these drawings is I fold the paper, I draw one side, and I, then I fold the paper in on itself, and I rub it from the back, and it transfers to the other side. I, I was going to do that today, but I'm not, not going to do that. Um, so the bum foot. Okay, stretch, well, stretcher won't come off. But um, so once you have the drawing, if you're only making four and not forty, you don't. Oops, I'm sorry. So if you're only making four and not forty, you don't really need this. You would need this if you're making forty. But all you need to do is take your drawing <coughs> and. Uh, Okay, this is this would be on the lathe, right? And you take your drawing and you just let oh, I got it back. Uh, right now. And and you would mark these lines directly off the drawing. And that's that's fine if you're only making four legs. Because you you know, you're just taking it right off the paper. So what I've done now is I folded the paper. This way. And I started out folding it this way when I transferred, and now I'm folding it the other way. And then the other thing about, about your full size drawing is that you can um, you can take your calendar <clears throat> and you can literally get these measurements directly from the drawing and say, okay, that's that size. Okay. And then this measurement, okay, and that's that size. And you, <coughs> you've actually literally got it right there on the <coughs> No, this is just computer paper. I just, I just taped it together with scotch paper. Yeah, well, this is, um, you know, th this was the first drawing, which was for the foot. And then I made that drawing to show the whole thing. So I just started with this. Right? And again, this is marked, marked right off there. Um, All right, what's the other thing about duplication? If you're a beginner spindle turner and your goal is to make four table legs that look alike, make more than four, then you take the four that look the most alike. Yeah. And the others become, well, they were your practice. I mean, certainly if you're a beginner, you need the practice, right? You know, it may be that you only have enough wood to make four. Well, that's kind of a tough situation for a beginner. They can't afford to screw up because that, that applies a sort of a psychological pressure. Um, so when you have six or seven blanks and you need to get four good ones out, 
that releases a lot of that psychological pressure. You know, or if I get a catch or this bead explodes, I still I still have six more. Okay, I still have five. More. I, I still have one extra. Tower and North. But at, at any rate, you, you know, and, and then after they're all said and done, you can look at them, um, and and you can see which four look the most alike, and you have the ones you can reject where you know, oh, this bead came out too small. I knew that. Uh, and so you need the practice, and that that's that's a good way to go. So you know, buy enough wood to make six or seven legs, and then uh, make them all as if every one was the final one. And then in the end, you have four that you'll probably be very happy with. So that's because making four legs that look alike is definitely an important milestone for beginners who are um, trying to learn spindle turning, furniture turning. Um, so there you go. Do, do a little bit at a time, fix your lathe center so that they're removing and replacing the workpiece um, to work smoothly. Um, do a little bit at a time. Oh, and then of course in the final sanding, that's another step. So when I sand my work, I take my tool rest base completely off the lathe because you don't want all that sanding grit into this mechanism anyway. You know, and then you've got all that freedom to move your hands around it and um, this isn't in a way. So that's why I do all the sanding as a final step. Um, after all the turning is done. Oh no, I never wet sand. No, I never used it. Never used it. I don't know. Do bolt turners do that? I I I have never done wet sand. Well, usually you wet sand uh, over your finish. To, um, oh well, I don't do finishing. I don't finish anything. Okay, well, I shouldn't say never. Um, when I was in the furniture masters and I was making finished pieces of furniture uh, during that period, but um, you know, ninety-eight percent of my work I deliver unfinished because the finishing's up to somebody else. Is the way I like it. <laughs> finishing is not something I've ever liked. <laughs> um, so what else can I tell you about duplication? Well, the, the, the sticks. Um, I don't need to show you the ball top. Oh, yeah. oh, can somebody who can walk around that way get this bed post over here? I put it over there yesterday and forgot all about it. It's, it's standing up over there. No, 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 against the wall. The big tall thing. Yeah, it's not as heavy as it looks because it's just pine. All right, so, you know, this, this is pine, and the last thing we looked at, poplar. Now, those things were made as design samples. They are not finished work. So before you, before you take cherry or walnut to make something like this, you make one out of pine or poplar first to make sure you've got everything figured out and that the customer is happy. Then you take the real wood and you make your four or your six. So these, these are design samples, right? Not finished wood. Because I don't make bed posts out of pine. I really don't make any furniture out of pine. I just want to talk a little bit about how to make the, the ball finials. Or on the ash leg, there was a little, this, this also has a ball that's intermediate in the turning, right? And this one is a ball finial. Right? And so in order to make these, you have to have a ball finial. Right. So how do you make a, a ball template? Well, the small ones like that, you just make with a, you just drill into a piece of plywood, you know, up to say two inches if you have spur bits. But when you get bigger than that, you need a circle cutter, you know, uh, with an arm that comes out that you adjust. So you, you generate this with a circle cutter so it's absolutely accurate. And you use, you use the ball template in two ways. First, you use it to check as you're forming the ball. And then in the end, you, you, pinch the paper, sandpaper between the template and the work to do the final refinement with sandpaper. Um, so the ball template does two things. It's a gauge and it's also a sandpaper uh, controller that refines the shape of the ball. I did, a, I did an article on, on balls for the journal and I had a, a four inch ball. And after I finished it, I, uh, my chronometer, the all different, I measured in about 20 different directions and it was accurate to about four thousandths of an inch. Using using a, a ball to okay thank you all right so now the last thing I'm going to do is um, show you about the steady rest so that's going to uh, could you take this off I'm going to set up 
I'm going to set up this workpiece. And let's say that this is a piece of uh, uh, furniture, maybe something like that, There's although it's actually even thinner than this leg. And I'm going to show you how you approach long, thin work. So what constitutes long, thin work? Well, if, if you're experiencing workpiece vibration, and that workpiece vibration is making trouble for you, then you need a steady rest. You shouldn't have to put up with workpiece vibration, you know, and you don't have to. Um, that's definitely the hard way. We don't like doing things the hard way. We like doing things the easy way. The easy way is to set your steady rest right away at the beginning. You know, very often you have a, a, a long, thin piece, and you say, well, I don't know. Do I need a steady rest? I don't know. I don't want to fool with it. And you start roughing it out. And you say, oh, you know, this is going pretty good. Um, and maybe you can control it with your hand or whatever. Um, but as you get further along in the turn and you start to cut away more material, it starts to get weaker and weaker and vibrate more and more. So just as you get to the end where you need everything to go just right, everything starts to go completely wrong. So the way to, the way to approach this is to set the steady rest at the beginning. Say, well, I know I'm gonna need steady rest for this. Um, and, and, and get the steady rest going from the beginning. You know, your, your first line of defense against workpiece vibration is to use your hand as a dampening agent. And, you know, one way you can, one way you can use a roughing gouge is with your hand uh, around the work and controlling the, the gouge with your thumb. And that, that works really well. This is in Frank Payne's book, by the way. Do you know who Frank Payne is? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, no. Well, he wrote, he's an Englishman um, who wrote a book in the 50s. Uh, he, it was a, the book is actually a compilation of a lot of magazine articles that were put together and I somewhat have to it. But he was a master uh, spindle turner. Most of what I learned, because when I learned this, there weren't any books. This is before the Renaissance. I mean, there weren't. <laughs> right? When I talk about the Renaissance, I'm talking about the 70s. Right? Uh, so there were only two books. There was Frank Payne, and, and there was uh, what's his name? The Volta. Yeah. Okay. Raffin. No, Raffin wasn't born. Uh, oh. No, I mean he was born. Actually, Raffin's almost as old as I. Um, okay. The guy whose son writes for Lieutenant. Um, 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 so it may be, in extreme cases, that you can't use a rough and gouge in the initial stage because it's just too big. Now, obviously, you can't dampen the workpiece with your hand while it's still square. However, once it gets a little bit round, it's amazing how you can use your hand. So what I'm going to try to do here is to set the steady rest in the middle of the workpiece. Here. And I'm going to see what might happen with the roughing gouge, see what happens. If, if I get too much vibration from the roughing gouge, I'm going to switch to a half inch trim. Let's just see what happens. That's pretty good. Are you saying, oh, that seems really solid. What the hell do you need here for steady rest? Well, that's because I haven't taken any wood out yet. <laughs> You know, when you when you take when you go from a square to a round, you're removing 23 percent of the material. And then when you go to the small diameters of your design, let's say your small diameters are half of your full diameter, then you're removing 75 percent of what's left. So what what you're finished with in the end in the small diameters is only about 20 or 25 percent of the strength that it is now. Now, even though it's only I've only just taken off the corner. I've only just taken off the corner. And yet, at this stage, I can start to use my hand uh, as a vibration thing. And as, with every stroke, I can feel that I'm being a little less brutal on my hand. You just don't want to, you just don't squeeze too tight. You're just trailing your fingers just enough so that you're dampening the vibration. So what I'm trying to do is create a place for the steady rest to go. I'm creating a journal, in fact, you know, a place for something to bear again. 
So as I get close to the end, I mean, I can, I can tell I'm close to the end because my fingers are telling me, right? I can feel these little flat spots here. I can feel with my fingers, right? In fact, that's a very, very accurate way to tell. So what I want to do now is just get it so the flat spots disappear. So why I'm using the, the, the point of this, of, of the nose of the chisel this way, because I want to make a very narrow chip. Because a very narrow chip is, a, is the way to produce less, uh, less cutting force and therefore less vibration. So what's important here is not that I get a really smooth line. What's important here is that I get perfect circularity. Right? Circularity means that every cutting circle is a true circle and not lopsided and, not, and doesn't have any uh, chatter marks. Because right, if you have, you cannot set a steady rest against chatter marks because then the steady rest would simply impart vibrations rather than quell them. So my fingers are telling me where the flat spots are. You know, for example, I can I can tell that there are still flat spots right there with my fingers, and there it is right there. I can feel that with my fingers very easily, but you can't see it, but you can feel it. <clears throat> and by the way, you can hear it too. Um, sorry. Sometimes it'll sound like it's cutting smooth when you get very close to the end, but a much better test is with your fingertips. So now I can tell that all the flat spots are gone. And I take a piece of 220 and I touch it there for one and a half seconds. That's all. Not more than that, because if you sand it more than that, you're going to make it lumpy. Anytime you sand a piece of wood, it becomes lumpy. Right? I don't want it to be lumpy. And then the thing I've got to. So now I've got that, and I take my wax and I do that. All right, now. Okay. Not that one. All right, it, it's here. I mean, I, I do. Yeah, I <laughs> I'm going to pass this around. So this is the kind of steady rest that I'm, I'm passing that around. And I, now I got to find the one I have for this guy. Oh, is it this one? Oh, it's this one. Okay. So when you, when you adjust the nut, the, the, the nut has to be adjusted so that there's no end play in this. It, it, it should it should spin around, but still I have a little friction, but you don't hear anything. So that's the right setting for that. So here we go. Of course, you have to have two tool rest bases to do this, right? I think. Oh, you know what? I think I, I wanted to use that. I don't know. Let's see if this one. I might need the other one to. to it's, oh, yeah. <coughs> That seems to work. All right. So back on. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna release this so that that's loose. And now I'm gonna bring this up to touch and lock it. And now you see this isn't gonna move up and down very much. Now I'm gonna tighten. Okay. We just have to. I just have to adjust this. One. Position like there, you'll be all right. He's having a little trouble with it. Oh, you know? okay, I'll be all right. I just need to go around that way. And now, this way. 
isn't that hard but I, I was not used to this and the handle was hitting the bed see on mine I just have a little nut and I take a wrench so I don't, I don't have this thing all right so you see how I can now that the height is set I never have to mess with that again so I never have to touch this handle again I can I can bring it in take it up bring it in take it up right? so I can I can do this I can, um, I can turn this in turn in if I want um, Put that in, and now I can just set this up again. Bang. Okay, how long does you know these things with the big wheels and all that? How long it takes to get those in and get those out, and then and then also pinching your fingers or whatever in there? This is just bang, bang like that. So this just touches there, and now let's say this is going to be a valve. You might want to you know go a little bit slower speed uh, when you're using a steady rest because. You don't want that to open, but you're going to put that in a place where you're going to cut that away again after. I'm just trying to make this more like a realistic job here with a, with a pommel. Okay, and um, now the rough and gush. Now, as I start to rough this out, you can hear how. How is that is because this is holding it. And the question about the sharp corners, see where I'm going to go over here? With the sharp corner of the roughing gouge. You know, sometimes it seems like the, maybe the vibration will okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's why the rather rough and gouge has a sharp corner so you can do that. You see this cross hand, right? So I'm guiding the chisel with my wrist. This is really important too, like where you're working up to a pommel. But of course I could turn it, if I didn't want to work this hard, I could turn it around. But, you know, the ability to keep turning it around end for end is very important. How you start out, and let's just see what happens as we progress, say, to cut um, a pattern of some kind. Remember when I get to, when I get this diameter to be half of this diameter, I'll have removed 75% of the material, right? Which is more like 85% of the material that I had when it was square. I'm still hearing some vibration. I don't know. 
where I have the stereo. I'm going to try to, uh, you know, also you have to move the stereo rest to a new place. I'm, I'm going to try move. Yeah, I'm going to try moving the stereo rest to a new place. I think I'm just going to do this and call it. This. As this becomes more flexible, sometimes you need to pull that up a little bit. You're actually bending the workpiece for you a little bit. Oh, that's good. You want us to not vibrate at all as you're going on there? That's good. So one time I was doing this and someone said, well, what would it do if you took the stereo rest away? I said, I don't know. I took the stereo rest away and I touched it with a chisel and it broke in half. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nobody got there. It's pretty good, man. So I'm going pretty deep here just to make a point. Uh, about how good this works. And where did I get the idea of the wooden shoe? Um, from Frank Payne's book. And he showed pictures of, and by the way, the pictures of the steady rest from Payne, Frank Payne's book were published in Fine Woodworking way back in the early days, in the late 70s. And what it showed was simply a stick with a V notch cut in it, a piece of wood that came up against the back. They used to call it a backrest because it pressed in from the back. But I had the idea of a shoe that was on a swivel because that aligns it and gives it more bearing, right? And also that the height was automatically set by the tool nest space. But of course, in order to use this, you have to have two tool nests. Um, but um, I don't know, Delta used to make cheap ones. Hard to get these now. Peter is a, a source for cheap okay, tool rest spaces. That one came from Woodwork with Supply. Oh. Okay, with a one inch, yeah. So you can see that the, the, the steady rest consists of a shoe that you can make yourself. When I used to sell them, I sold them with two shoes, a large and a small. Um, the, the shank is simply a single piece of metal turned down to a half inch and threaded on the top. This is a nylon locking, locking. that's a, you can adjust that. Or you could lock two nuts together. You know, this has to be adjusted every time the weather changes. Right, so when it's more humid, this expands and gets too tight. You know, even uh, day to day, you have to make very minor adjustments in this. Um, so that's my steady rest system that I use on everything that's more than that long. Mm. You know, pretty much. I mean, a table like like a one and three quarter table leg, I would never consider making that without a steady rest. I mean, I could maybe, but it's the hard way. I don't like doing things the hard way. Um, so, I guess I'm done. Well, thank you very much yeah. for your attention. Thank you.